I'd just finished my shift and was walking out of the coffee shop to head home when I suddenly heard a voice say, Hi, are you Catherine Mill? Ugh, what else? I'm exhausted already! I reluctantly turned around to a view that almost made me leap out of my skin. Standing in front of me was a girl with a face exactly like mine. Who, who are you? I stammered. I felt like I was seeing things. She smiled at me and said, I'm Tracy. Is this wallet yours? Oh, wow, you found it. I dropped it at the Seattle Mariners baseball game. I never thought I'd see it again. That's right. We met there. Then Tracy took out a cap and put it on. Hang on. That hat seemed so familiar. And so did that smile. Um, are you the one I accidentally bumped into at the stadium? That must have been when I dropped my wallet. I was in such a hurry to get to my seat that I'd gone crashing into Tracy. At the time, she was wearing that cap, so all I saw was her smile. But now seeing her standing here, it was like looking in the mirror. I kept staring at her as she said, Yep, that was me. In fact, I came to find you not just to return your wallet, but because I need a favor. Can we chat for a sec? Um, sure. Let's go back inside the cafe. What favor could she possibly want? Well, I was about to find out. Catherine, I'm just going to say it outright. We have something in common, don't we? I hesitated to speak up, but I knew exactly what she was talking about. She then continued. I mean, look at us. You're basically my doppelganger, which brings me to this favor to ask for. Kathy, I was hoping you'd impersonate me. I'll pay you, of course. I'll pay you a lot. Before I could even reply, Tracy handed me an envelope and showed me a photo of some very posh-looking people. This is my family, she said. Wait, what? Turns out they were royals, or something close to. Her grandfather had been an earl in the UK, and then they'd moved over here to Washington. They're what you'd call an aristocratic family. So, yep, mega wealthy. Must be nice, I thought. However, it was suffocating Tracy, and that all of the duties that came with being from a family of nobility drove her crazy. Plus, one other little problem. She was in love with a guy that her family definitely wouldn't approve of, because he came from a normal family. Her parents had arranged for her to marry the son of one of the country's richest CEOs. And so that's what led us to now. She wanted to hire me to pretend to be her, so that she could be with her lover boy without troubles. I was stunned. What if someone finds out? I muttered and shoved the envelope back into her hands, saying that it was too much money. But Tracy just laughed. Oh, this is just the initial payment. You'll receive so much more. Please, I'm begging you. Think about it. Then she looked at me with proper sadness in her eyes. I really did feel sorry for her, but I needed some time, and it would be better to get my mom's opinion on this first. Ever since I'd been a little girl, I'd always talked things through with her. She was the only family I had, and the only one I could trust and rely on. Mom would know what to do. When I got home, I found my mom waiting for me at the table. We ate dinner together in silence, as I could barely focus. She knew something was up right away. Honey, what happened at work? I hesitated, then handed her the photo of Tracy's family. My mom, as you can guess, was shocked to see how much Tracy looked like me, and so I told her what had gone down earlier. I explained that she offered me a ton of money to impersonate her, but that it felt risky. I'd assumed my mom would be dead set against it, but what she said surprised me. That poor girl. Indeed, how people always say it's not as fun as it looks being too wealthy. But hey, a bit of extra money in your pocket couldn't hurt. I mean, you could use it to pay for your vocal training. And at the same time, you'd help Tracy, so that she can be with her true love. Yeah, becoming a singer had been a lifelong dream of mine. But because of money struggles, I'd had to put that aside. Mom's right. This was my chance. I had to take it, so I called Tracy to seal the deal. She was over the moon about it, and we arranged to meet the next day to start preparing. 
I thought I'd just have to learn all of her favorite things and maybe borrow some of her clothes so that I didn't get caught out. But no, there was a whole lot more to it than that. For starters, I had to take etiquette classes. Can you even believe? That first day, I had lessons on how to walk properly. They legitimately did put books on my head to improve my posture. And then came the elocution lessons to teach me how to speak more clearly. Seriously, was this princess diaries or what? But the best part, though, was her wardrobe. Wow, her outfits were to die for. Now that's what gave me the urge to dive into the royal life now. Everything was going well until we sat down to go through all of her likes and dislikes. Her dislikes were about a mile long. Oh man, Tracy was one fussy girl. I mean, who didn't like pizza? I basically lived off the stuff. Plus, she was vegan, gluten-free, and had a nut allergy. What did she even eat? But despite that, we got through the week. Every morning I had my etiquette classes, which now were easy peasy. I could totally pull it off as a high society girl. And then in the afternoons, I hung with Tracy and learned everything I could about her. By the end of the week, we got all things set and ready for the swap. So Tracy and I went out to celebrate. Catherine, look at our faces, she said while squinting her eyes. I took a closer look at the phone screen and gotta admit, despite being pretty identical, there were still some differences between us. Sure, her cheekbones were more prominent and her nose was slightly upturned, but with a bit of makeup, I could fix that, right? Tracy wasn't convinced though. Listen, I think you're going to need to get plastic surgery. Wait, I wasn't ready for any of that. But on second thought, I guess that would be all right, as it'd only make me prettier, which would totally help with my singing career. So I went under the knife. Not only my nose and cheekbones were fixed, but they also added a birthmark to my shoulder to match the one Tracy had. I looked like an Egyptian mummy with all my bandages on, coming out of the operating room. But when the day came to remove them, I was amazed. Just a little touch-up could make me look this incredible. I twirled around in front of the mirror in one of Tracy's glitzy dresses and just smiled. We were totally going to pull this off. Tracy was even more excited than me. She turned to me and said, Ready for the family party? Oh, wow. So my first mission had arrived already. I nervously looked at Tracy, and she just giggled and said, Oh, don't be nervous. It's just my cousin's baby's first birthday party. No big deal. Although, Thomas's whole family will be there. That's the family I'm meant to marry into. Okay, now I was even more worried. Tracy told me to simply do what I learned in the classes. As for Thomas, she instructed me to just ignore him, as that's what she usually did. He was used to the cold shoulder. <laughs> Well, the moment I arrived at the party, I was already so overwhelmed. I couldn't believe my eyes. Her cousin's house was basically a palace with butlers and a grand staircase as you entered, just like in the movies. I almost had to pinch myself that I was even there. As I walked in, one of the butlers asked me to follow him through to the banquet hall. A banquet hall? How insane! There were crystal chandeliers hanging from every part of the ceiling, and the room looked like it was literally made from gold. I noticed Tracy's dad standing in the middle of the room with a young couple and a baby. That would be Tracy's cousin, and the baby was obviously the reason this insane party had been thrown. I took a deep breath, gathered myself, and walked towards them in the way my etiquette teacher had taught me. I greeted them casually, and it seemed no one sensed anything weird. Not even Tracy's dad. However, I was still afraid someone would realize. So I grabbed a glass of wine and went to stand in the corner just to be safe. While I was fiddling with the glass and trying not to make eye contact with anyone, a guy came up to me and clinked my glass. Oh boy, the coolest, most handsome guy ever was standing there grinning at me. I smiled back at him politely, trying not to blush. And then I realized, wasn't he Thomas and Tracy, the happy couple? Suddenly, I heard Tracy's dad from a few feet away, speaking towards us. You two look exquisite together. B 
Be good to him now, Tracy, won't you? Yep, it's Thomas, the fiancé that Tracy doesn't like at all. Okay, so I need to act cold towards him, otherwise I'll ruin everything for Tracy. But heck, he was just so good-looking. I quickly walked away towards the dessert table and started stuffing my face with some almond cookies, anything to distract myself from Thomas. As I picked up a third one, I heard Thomas scream, and the next moment he was running over to me shouting, Tracy, put it down! There are nuts in those! I dropped the cookie in shock. Right. I was supposed to be allergic to these delicious snacks. Totally forgot that. Gosh. I turned around to see all eyes were on me. This was a disaster. I was like a deer in the headlights. Didn't know what else to do. I pretended to faint. Thomas immediately carried me somewhere while others called the family doctor. I only took a peek when I felt like I was let down on a bed. And wow, even their guest room is gorgeous. Anyway, the doctor did some quick checkup and said I was okay. Well, obviously. Then Thomas rushed over, holding my hand and kept saying, Thank God you're okay, baby. Really? How come Tracy didn't like him? He was so sweet. He was looking at me so lovingly. Wait, at Tracy, actually. Oh boy, this was getting weird. Guess I have started off this mission on the wrong foot. But having that first incident actually helped me become more careful, so I've been getting better and better at playing Tracy. I was like a secret agent that would be summoned by duty at any sec. Sometimes you'd find me as a princess, other times I'd be waiting tables. My life was getting busier, but much more fun in some senses. Then one day, Tracy suddenly appeared at my door, looking all loved up. How strange it was. Usually she only contacted me over the phone. Then she said, Kathy, I have a big mission for you. As she sat down... She put a bulging envelope on the table and said, Kathy, sweetie, I need a big favor this time. So, here's the thing. Me and Arnold are going to Asia for a month, and, um, I was wondering if you could maybe move into my house and cover for me? I was shocked. A month? Um, that's quite a long time. I mean, surely I'll get caught. Oh, I'm not sure, Tracy. I tried to avoid her eye contact, but she kept begging and looking like she was about to cry. Oh god, what should I do? Guys, please give me some advice. And stay tuned. I'll be back with part two to tell you how things go down. <sighs> Why do I have uneasy feelings about all this? These need to be washed by hand. Kelly threw a pile of clothes on the floor. And be quick about it! Hey, I'm Maya, and that bossy girl is Kelly. Although we live in the same house, we aren't siblings. You see, when I was just a baby, I was adopted by a loving old couple. They lived on a farm in the countryside. Their kids had grown up and left home, and they were both missing the lively energy that only a child could bring. One Sunday at church, they saw the priest raising a baby girl and offered to help. So that's how they ended up taking me home and bringing me up as their grandchild. They were the nicest people, and they showered me in nothing but love and kindness. I'm always more than grateful for them. We lived together happily, until one day, when Grandpa was in the orchard, he collapsed. Sadly, he passed away. Grandma was never the same after that. She'd lost her soulmate. Her health also deteriorated, and then one night, she called me into her room, and gripping my hand, she said, Sweetie, you brought so much joy into our lives. Without us, life could be tough, but don't worry, we're always with you. When I'm gone, go find my old purse hidden in the broken tractor in the back barn. We've saved up a little bit for you. Our little Maya have to live your best life, all right? Then, before I could ask her any more about this, she closed her eyes, and just like that, she'd left me forever. I stayed with her for hours, crying my heart out. Afterward, following Grandma's words, I went in search of the money. Oh, God! I gasped in shock as I opened the purse. 
There was at least $20,000 here. How did my grandparents manage to save up such an amount of money? I knew they were thrifty, but this was way too much. After that, I moved to Columbus to live with my grandparents' daughter, Mrs. Madison, and her daughter, Kelly. So you're wondering what I did with the money, right? Well, I keep it hidden here, in this crack in the roof. Oh, someone's coming. Your room is disgusting. Anyway, Kelly and I are going out, so make sure you clean everywhere before we get back. I expect it to be spotless. I gave a weak nod and watched her totter away. This wasn't a new occurrence. Every day, they'd mess up the house, then force me to clean it. I know, I was basically the real-life Cinderella. But it's okay. As soon as I turned 18, I'm gonna leave this place anyway and start living my own life with my money. The next morning, it was raining, so I tried to walk to school as fast as possible, when suddenly, Kelly drove past me and deliberately sped through this big puddle. Mud splattered all over me. Jeez, why is torturing me her favorite hobby? My shirt was filthy, and as I walked toward my locker, some girls laughed at me. One even sneered. The dirty look must be trendy in the countryside, but here it just looks tragic. Yeah, I've been in the city for almost a year now, but I still couldn't fit in. Maybe it's because I always wear the same worn-out clothes and borrow all my books from the library. Mrs. Madison refused to buy me anything new, and I couldn't use my own money, as that would look suspicious. I couldn't even afford to go on the school picnic. <sighs> I'd never be one of them. Then, during recess, the class monitor Josie informed everyone that prom was happening soon, and the dress code was formal. While all the other kids squealed and clapped excitedly, I lowered my head and sighed. I had nothing to wear to prom. Maya? Hearing my name broke me from my thoughts, and I realized it was Josie, and standing around her were some of the nice girls from class. You have to come to prom this time, please? You've never joined us in any other activities before. Don't worry, we will help you look spectacular. I gave an awkward smile and replied, Thanks, guys, but I can't expect you to do that. They all insisted that I should go, but I remained adamant that it wasn't my kind of thing. Then came Meanie Kelly. Maya isn't suitable for this type of event. How dare she say that? I mean, just because I wasn't a spoiled princess didn't mean I wasn't suitable to attend. So I turned to Josie and smiled. Actually, that sounds fun. I will go to the prom. That evening at dinner, I mentioned the prom to Mrs. Madison and suggested that it could be a reward in exchange for doing all the housework. She coldly replied, You live under my roof rent-free, and now you expect me to do housework for you too? Or what, your majesty? Then she turned to Kelly, smiled and asked, Darling, have you decided on a prom dress yet? Then Kelly showed her mom pictures of gorgeous dresses on her phone while throwing smirks at me. Ugh! I couldn't sit around looking at Kelly's smug face anymore. This time, I definitely had to go to prom and be prettier than her. So that weekend, I went thrift store shopping with Josie. And after looking in about a dozen stores, Josie lifted up this really pretty blue gown. It had a tear down the side, but I knew I could easily sew that up and thrift flip it a little. I'd seen people do that on YouTube. The night of the prom, Josie did my hair and makeup, and I showed up in the dress. I felt like a real-life princess, and everyone was looking at me and giving me compliments, while Kelly stood there with her arms folded and a sulky look on her face. And then this boy called David walked over to me and started talking. Turns out, he was the new senior here. All the girls had their eyes on him, including Kelly, who walked over and tried offering him a drink, but he snubbed her and continued talking to me, leaving her standing there in silent anger before storming out of the prom. I had such a wonderful night with my new friends. I arrived home in a great mood and was happily singing to myself. But this instantly changed when I saw Kelly sitting there waiting for me. Such a thief! Now, don't tell me this fancy dress just fell down on you from the sky! 
Kelly shouted at me. I insisted that I hadn't stolen anything, so she dragged Mrs. Madison to the living room and asked her to check if she had lost any money recently. Mrs. Madison said no without thinking at first, but when she read Kelly's face, she started to fake complaining about some hundred-dollar bills missing from her purse, and the two started to jump on me. Ugh! Unbelievable! I ran up to my room and tried to shake away the negative thoughts and think back to how happy I was at prom. Then, as usual, I checked my hiding spot. Huh? What was that noise? I looked towards the stairs, but no one was there. Hmm. It was probably just the house creaking or something. The next day at school was amazing, as loads of kids stopped and talked to me. Then, when I got home, I went up to my room and double-checked my hiding spot. My heart plummeted in my chest. The purse! It had gone! I frantically searched for it. Then I remembered hearing something last night, and there were only three of us in this house. Could it be? Furious, I ran into the living room where Mrs. Madison and Kelly were watching TV. I shouted at them. My money! I want it back right now! In an unconcerned tone, Mrs. Madison replied, What money? What are you talking about? Oh, I see. So you have your own money all along, and have been keeping it for yourself? Puff, what an ungrateful brat! Mom lets you live here even though you aren't actually family, and now you're accusing us of stealing? I knew they'd taken my money, but what could I do about it? I had no choice but to go back to my room and cried as I looked at old photos of me with my grandparents. The next day at school, I really wasn't in the mood for lessons. During recess, I was just staring out of the window in despair when I heard a cough, so I looked and saw David there. Hey, Maya. He smiled at me. Are you okay? You seem kind of down. I'm fine. I gathered up my stuff and left. I know he was only being nice, but I wasn't feeling like small talking right now. Then, after school, Kelly made me carry her heavy backpack home. I had no energy left to argue, so I glumly did as she asked. That's when David drove up alongside me and asked, Hey, that looks heavy. Do you need a lift? I nodded and got into his car while forcing a smile to thank him. He asked, Maya, what's up? You can talk to me, you know. I'm a good listener. Promise. He's so sweet, and I instantly felt safe around him. We chatted a lot and started hanging out more and more after that. We took walks through the park and had lunch together. I found myself growing closer to him, but not in the way you might think. No, more like a brother. Then, a few weeks later, when Mrs. Madison made me clean up the mess in the house that she'd made again... I found something under her bed. The old purse that Grandma had left me. And the money was all gone! I stormed downstairs and slammed the purse onto the kitchen table. But Mrs. Madison shrugged. It was my mother's purse. Therefore, that money belongs to me. You obviously stole it from my poor elderly parents. Kelly backed up her mom with her annoying tone. Wow! How low do you have to be to con a sick old lady into giving you her life savings? Grandma left it for me, not you! You two are monsters! I screamed at them, took the purse, and went up to my room. I started to pack, then I was leaving here once and for all. Only, when I went to try the door, I couldn't open it. O-M-G! They'd locked me in! Worse still... In all the drama, I'd left my phone downstairs, so I couldn't even call David for help. The next day, Mrs. Madison let me out, but only on the condition that I did all the housework, and from now on, I wasn't allowed to go to school or anything like that. And if I broke this rule, she'd make sure I ended up in trouble for stealing the money. So, it is what it is. I had no choice. They've caught me on a string. One afternoon, I was out front watering the flowers when Mrs. Madison shouted out from the living room. No! Not the roses! Water the ones over there! You useless girl! Then suddenly, I felt someone yank my arm. It's David! 
He was worried about my absence, so he came to check on me. Maya, there's someone I want you to meet. Then he signaled me to follow him. I had no idea where David was taking me, but anything would be a way better option than listening to any more of Mrs. Harrison's nagging, so I got in his car. He took me to his house, and there was this man in there. I suppose it's David's dad, but then, with tear-filled eyes, the man blurted out, Maya, it's you, my daughter, you're finally home. Huh? What? So, after I sat down and had a sip of water to brace myself for whatever was about to come, the two told me about how when I was a baby, my mom got sick and passed away. My dad struggled to look after me and my brother, so he gave me to a priest. Eventually, my dad managed to turn his life around, and knowing that I'd been adopted by the elderly couple, he started sending money to them to help them raise me. Then, when he came to find me, I wasn't there anymore. He found out that I was living with the daughter of an elderly couple in Columbus. So he moved to this city with the hope of finding me. It was such a coincidence that David ended up attending the same school as me. David said that the first time he saw me, he felt this strange bond right away. And how amazing that this gut feeling was right. As it soon became clear, I was his long-lost sister. Wow, this was a lot to take in but it was the greatest news ever. I left Mrs. Madison's house after that, of course, and moved in with my dad and brother. And for the first time since I'd lost my grandparents, I found myself feeling truly happy again. Now, you're probably wondering what became of Mrs. Madison and Kelly. Well, I was walking past their house the other day and saw a for sale sign in the yard. Turns out, Mrs. Madison had been spending money like water, and now was in debt, so she was having to sell the house. I don't want to gloat or anything, but I guess that's karma for them. Who put those books on the upper shelf? And why were my clothes in the closet reorganized? Did she seriously go into my room and rearrange my stuff? Unbelievable! Avery, dinner's ready. Okay, Dad, wait a sec. My dad shouted back. What's taking you so long? Come down now. Dinner is getting cold. Ugh, okay, I'm coming. As I walked into the kitchen, I gave her a resentful look. What were you doing? You know dinner's always at six. Well, that's because she went into my room and reorganized everything. It was like Hurricane Katrina stopped by my room. I had to put everything back where it was. You must be wondering why I had this attitude towards my mom. Well, first, she isn't my mom. She's my stepmom. And second, I just couldn't stand her. You see, my parents divorced when I was 15. And after just six months, my dad started dating Rose. My first impressions weren't great. I mean, look at her. Okay, she's kind of beautiful, but her style just doesn't fit her age. She has this whole wannabe rocker thing going on. No, I'm serious. She even has a tank top that says, I'm a rocker mom. My actual mom was the total opposite of Rose. She looks how a mom's meant to, with her elegant clothes and polite demeanor. And that's also how she raised me to be. Then there's the age difference. Rose is a decade younger than Dad. Suspicious? What if she was only after his money? I thought they wouldn't last, but then one year later, they announced that they were getting married. So, yeah, you can see where my hate was coming from. That's enough of me telling you about my family. Let's go back to this boring dinner. My dad just gently said, Rose was just helping you. She didn't mean it. Now let's dig in. This smells delicious, honey. Ugh, whatever. I rolled my eyes and sat at the table. I looked down and couldn't believe my eyes. It was spinach and sausage lasagna, Mom's signature dish. How dare Rose copy it? First, she rearranged my room, and now she wanted to replace my mom? Talk about a real-life evil stepmom. No way I was going to eat that. So I stood up, 
said I wasn't hungry, and started walking off. Dad stood up and was about to yell at me, but Rose stopped him. Whatever. I still ran upstairs and slammed my door shut. The next day, when I came home from school, I saw that Rose had a few friends over for beer and pizza in the living room. Look at them. They looked like they were having a band meeting. Normally, women their age have tea parties, not fast food fests. Hey, Avery. Rose greeted me. I just ignored her and went upstairs. But suddenly, I heard one of her friends say, What a stubborn kid. Doesn't she have manners? If I were you, I would show the kid who's the boss around here. Jesus, her friends were awful just like her. Whatever, I didn't care what they said. But then Rose replied, Hey, don't talk about her like that. Avery's a lovely girl. She's just had a lot going on the past two years. Every child would behave the same after their parents' divorce, don't they? She just needs a little time adjusting. Oh, wow. I didn't expect those words coming from Rose. She actually stood up for me? Maybe, just maybe, I've misjudged her. Maybe I should try and give her a fairer chance? So, that evening, when I saw her watching a movie... I walked over with a big bowl of popcorn and asked if I could join her. Rose looked shocked, like she'd seen a ghost or something. Then she gave me a big smile and said, Of course, I would really love that. I sat down next to her, and we watched Mad Max together. Oh, wow. There was a lot of violence and some weird-looking characters. Normally, I don't watch these kinds of films. I'm more of a rom-coms girl. But that movie was really... Um, interesting. We talked during it, and I must say Rose is actually kinda cool. We were both laughing when I heard someone coughing behind me. I turned around to see my mom standing there with a frown on her face. Avery? Why didn't you return my calls and messages? Oh, I haven't introduced my mom to you yet. This is my beautiful mom, Melanie. She's a kind, gentle, elegant woman and also a bit disciplined. But that's okay. I still love my mom very much. Mom? What are you doing here? I called you a dozen times, but you didn't answer. Clearly, you're preoccupied. I got worried, so I swung by to check on you. Oh, sorry, Mom. Rose and I were having so much fun that I didn't notice my phone. My mom knitted her brows and asked, Are we still on for shopping tomorrow? You need a new outfit for the debate contest, right? Yeah, of course. I will meet you at the mall after school. Oh, you two are going shopping? That's so cool. Can I join? At that moment, I thought, what a great idea. I mean, so far, they seem to get along okay. But what I didn't know was that a war between my mom and my stepmom had just launched. Rose gave me an excited smile. But Mom, on the other hand, didn't look so thrilled. Maybe she was still mad that I missed her calls? So the next day after school, I went outside and saw my mom standing by her car. Oh, was she waiting for me? I was about to walk toward her when I suddenly noticed she was giving dirty looks to someone. Oh my god, Rose was waiting on the other side of the street. I quickly jumped behind some bushes to hide from them. Don't tell me the two were here to pick me up. Suddenly, my phone rang. It was mom. There's no way I was deciding between them, so I told her I was already on my way to the mall. Ugh. Now, let's talk about my fun family day out at the mall. Hmm. It was a disaster. My mom and Rose have very different style, hobs, so my mom chose this elegant black vest and skirt for me, but Rose thought I looked like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> no offense, She's a badass who brought justice to women, but Rose was kind of right. That outfit just didn't work for me. Then Rose chose this red dress for me, but oh man, that's kind of revealing. They were constantly dragging me from this shop to the other like they were playing tug of war, and I was the freaking rope. I couldn't handle it anymore. Therefore, I just chose any dress so they'd stop throwing clothes in my face. On the way out of the mall, we passed a piercing shop. I've been wanting a helix piercing at the upper cartilage of my ear. They look so cool. I asked mom, but she profusely refused. 
Her own words were, it would make you look rebellious. Hayes, mom was still strict as always. Nonsense. Rose snorted. Melanie, Avery's old enough to make her own decisions. If she wants a piercing, then let her. Then she turned to me and said, come, I will take you inside. Oh my god, I couldn't believe it. I glanced at mom, and she looked like she was about to explode with anger. But Rose had a point. I'm already 16 for crying out loud. After 15 minutes, Rose and I came out. Oh, thank God. Did you reconsider getting that ear piercing? Oh, yeah. Rose said that a nose piercing would suit me better. What? Uh-oh. Maybe the nose piercing wasn't such a good idea, because the tension between them was now catastrophic. Hmm. I needed a way to bring them together. So I came up with a brilliant plan. I arranged a holiday in Brazil for us all. I have a friend there, Pedro. He was an exchange student at my school, so he could show us around. Dad was in on the plan. At the last minute, he pretended to be busy and canceled his spot. Perfect. Now Rose and Mom would have plenty of bonding time. As soon as we walked into the hotel lobby, they started fighting over who got to share a room with me. What's wrong with them? We just landed in Brazil. So I took the keys from the receptionist and told them they were sharing, because I'll be by myself. <laughs> then in the evening, after we all got some rest, I waited for them in the lobby. Man, what's taking them so long? Suddenly, I saw two women walking over, and they were pushing each other. My God, it was Rose and Mom. I tried to keep calm and said, Jesus, can you two please stop acting like kindergarten kids? Mom sneered. Well, Rose over here took a 45-minute shower while I urgently needed to use the bathroom. You know how sensitive my stomach is. Rose rolled her eyes. That's because I have a strict beauty routine to follow. At least you got some sleep. I didn't, thanks to your bulldozer snoring. I certainly did not. Then they began to stare off like two UFC fighters. I shouted, Enough already! Listen up! I just made a dinner reservation for you two to get to know each other better. I have plans with Pedro, so I'll catch you both later. They were about to refuse, but I gave them this really intense look. Well, at least you're having fun. You two should hit a bar. Nothing can top some Brazilian bars. No drinking! and be back by 10 p.m. tops. Yeah, yeah, I know. Have fun. I waved at them and left the hotel. The next morning, I saw them talking to each other. Actually talking, not bickering. So I walked over to them and asked, Well, how was dinner? Then they told me it was actually really great. They were able to put their differences aside and got along. Success! <laughs> so now I could enjoy the rest of the trip. After breakfast, Pedro came by to take us on a hiking trip in the forest. It was so wonderful. The fresh air, the birds singing. Well, maybe except for the heat and the mosquitoes. Pedro wanted to bring us to this spot he said was perfect for watching the sunset. Awesome! It was all going well at first, but then as Rose avoided a tree branch, it accidentally hit my mom. My God, you hit me on purpose, didn't you? What? That's absurd. I was just avoiding the branch. Oh, please. As if. Are you saying that I'm lying? Hey, guys, stop it. Let's be more understanding and talk things out. Like how you did it last night, okay? That's when I found out that they were just pretending to be friends so that I didn't set up any more dinners for them. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. After their friendship act was exposed... They began speed hiking, like they were in a competition or something. But, yep, after only 15 minutes, they were exhausted and couldn't even stand straight anymore. I began to shout at them. This is great. Your dumb feud is ruining my vacation. Then I walked away to avoid them, but of course, not too far. As I walked, I tried to think of another plan to get them close. Then I realized I'd wandered further away from the group. Okay, Avery, don't panic. Pedro had given me a map of the forest, 
I just needed to get to that marked X. It sounded easy. Trust me, it wasn't. I walked for hours and still couldn't find the spot. Oh no, it was getting dark and I was totally exhausted. I sat on the ground and couldn't hold back my tears. I was about to lose hope when I suddenly heard Rose and Mom's voices. Oh great, I was lost and could still hear them arguing in my head. I must be losing my mind. But wait, suddenly they appeared from behind some trees. It was really them. I couldn't believe it. I ran into their arms and gave them both the biggest hug ever and cried like a baby. Before we went to the airport to head home, Pedro came to say goodbye. Thanks for the hiking trip and also carrying out my plan. No problem. Your plan was definitely crazy, but it totally worked. After you went missing, they actually teamed up to find you. They helped one another when one tripped down or got exhausted and kept each other motivated. Pedro grinned at me, then continued. I too was freaking out when I didn't see you at our meeting point. Luckily, I still found you. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that pretending to be lost was a part of my plan, but what I didn't expect was to actually get lost. Thank God for Pedro. And you know what? After that incident, my mom and Rose grew close. Actually, a bit too close, I think. <laughs> They even sometimes hang out without me. Can you believe it? Turns out, even though they have two very different personalities and styles, they still have one big thing in common. They both love me. I'm standing in the middle of the room wearing this extravagant dress and a glittery mask. All eyes are on me, but I can sense how ingenuine they are. This is supposed to be my sweet 16th, and yet all of these guests were complete strangers. Ugh, it's all that slimeball Gregory's fault. Actually, this OTT party was all down to him. Oh, hi, I'm Vivian, but my friends call me Viv. My mom, Jacqueline Mars, is one of the wealthiest people on Earth. So. I grew up thinking massive mansions, gigantic pools, and a floor entirely for toys was the norm. Well, at least I did until I turned 10. That day I was playing in my life-size dollhouse when I heard talking coming from the other side of the fence. I peeked over it and saw a woman and a girl around my age who looked kind of weird. Curious, I spoke up. Hey you, why do you dress so funny? Pardon? What did you say? You don't even have shoes on. That's so silly. You're the silly one. Bet you've never tasted this before, huh? So try it. Spoiled rich kids like you always look down on others. While in fact, you're no use to society. I just stood there dumbfounded as the security shooed them away. I never meant to offend her. I, I was just curious. So I rushed inside the house to find mom and ask her about this. Oh, honey, not anyone can be as wealthy as we are. That means you don't have to worry about a thing, sweet pea. Now go play so mommy can work, okay? Even to this day, mom's words still linger in my ears. I've grown to resent my family's wealth. I just wanted to be a normal kid. That's why, by the time I got to middle school, I convinced mom to let me transfer from my private school to a public one and wipe out everything about me online, so no one would know about my influential family. I get the bus to school, buy clothes from thrift shops, and prepare my own lunch instead of bringing the gourmet dish the chefs make for me. A perfect normal life. Until Gregory, mom's so-called boyfriend, showed up. He sticks his big nose in everything. Thanks to him, mom wouldn't stop nagging at me about my clothing, my trashy public school, or how I gotta stop hanging out with the mediocre kids. Ugh, he is driving me insane. And to top it off, he gave mom the idea of throwing me a 16th birthday party. I hate attention. Mom knows this. But what Gregory wants, Gregory gets. This could be an opportunity to introduce her to society and gain new associates. It'd be good for her when she takes over business in the future, blah, blah, blah. Poof. Please. The only thing that man cares about is himself and his associates, not mine. In the end, I agreed to a masquerade ball, on one condition. Mom has to stop interfering with who I should or shouldn't hang out with, especially my friends at school. 
And that brings us to the present. Right when the host announces that it's time for... My first dance? Huh? My what now? Ugh. Gregory! I was confusedly looking around to find a partner, when suddenly a hand grabbed me. Birthday girl, come dance with me. Ugh, what a creep. Let go! Can somebody help me with this? Suddenly a boy around my age appeared. Oh my. He has the most beautiful gray eyes I've ever seen. Excuse me, sir. I believe the lady has agreed to have her first dance with me. Thank you, handsome stranger. As we danced, I couldn't help but stare dreamily into those gorgeous eyes of his. We were about to leave the dance floor when he whispered in my ear, Wait here. I'll be right back. <sighs> Who would have thought a superficial party like this would lead me to my perfect guy? Suddenly, I heard a snapping sound behind me, and as I turned around, my mask fell off. Oh no, a paparazzi cut my mask string. I tried to cover my face with my hands, but it was no use. Luckily, Mum rushed over and hid me behind her. Sorry, everyone, but the party's over. We had a great time and hope to see you all again soon. Then she led me back to my room, while the security showed everyone the way out. From that moment on, my ordinary life ended for good. My face was plastered all over the internet as the billionaire Jacqueline Mars' daughter. Now everyone at school is looking at me funny. I don't get it, guys. I'm still the same old Viv. Oh, there my besties are. They would surely have my back, right? But nope. As I approached them, they went ballistic on me, saying how I don't trust them enough to confess about my actual background. So from now on, we're no longer friends. This is so unfair. I never asked for any of this. I wipe away my tears, trying to act like nothing happened. Huh? What's this? There's a note lying on top of my books that says, Hey, it's me, the guy from your birthday party. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. If you need anyone to talk to, text me anytime. Oh, so he's from our school? Wow, just when I thought no one's there for me, he showed up again. But there's no name, though. Is he still playing this mysterious game? Okay, I'll just call him my mask tonight, then. From that day on, we texted non-stop. He just gets me. My family situation, my friends, everything. One time, he even secretly slid a Blackpink concert ticket in my bag, since I once told him that I was their diehard fan. Another time, he sent me a gift card to my all-time favorite ice cream store, Ben & Jerry's, just to cheer me up on a bad day. Aww. This ice cream tastes delicious, but I can't help wishing the Masked Knight was here with me. All I know is he has the most beautiful gray eyes and gorgeous black hair. Hmm. Oh, speak of the devil. Hey, I have a surprise for you this Valentine's Day. Hope you're as excited to see me as I am to see you. Finally, I get to meet the boy I'm crazy about. I can't wait. On Valentine's Day, I was in English staring out of the window and thinking about my masked knight. I wonder what he looks like. Ladies, I brought your Valentine's roses. Here you go, Viv. This is it. It's gotta be from him. Happy Valentine's Day. Have a taste of the rose, then come meet me at the pool. X. I quickly unwrapped the candy, popped it into my mouth, then rushed to meet my dream man. Well, where was he? As I tried calling him, the room started to spin. I saw the outline of a blurred black figure, then... Ugh... My head is killing me. Where am I? And whose hand am I holding? Hold on. Those eyes. He must be. Thank goodness you're awake. Uh, are you the one who danced with you at your birthday party? In the flesh. I'm Jeremiah, by the way. I had higher hopes for our first face-to-face -face meeting, but oh well. <laughs> Turns out, he always knew I went to the same school as him but he was a bit intimidated by my family's influence, so he decided to get to know me via text first. He said the cops had found some sort of sleep-inducing substance in my rose candy. Before I could quiz him anymore on this, Mom barged into the room and hugged me. After making sure I was okay, she turned to Jeremiah and said, You saved my daughter. For that, I can never thank you enough. Please join us for dinner tomorrow night. 
Jeremiah seemed hesitant at first, but then he nodded in agreement. Hmm. The dinner did not go as planned. Between Mum's blatant interrogating and Gregory's menacing looks, I could sense Jeremiah's discomfort. Then when Jeremiah asked where the restroom was, Gregory insisted on showing him. When Jeremiah returned, he seemed flustered and made his excuses to leave. Gah. What had that annoying Gregory said to him? I quickly followed Jeremiah and apologized, but he just smiled and offered to pick me up for school tomorrow. The cops haven't found the culprit yet, so from now on, I'll be your guardian. How sweet. After that, I hung out with him every day. Great, right? Only, somehow it didn't feel the same as when we were texting. Back then we had a deep connection. Now it was just like two friends hanging out. Oh, and not to mention Olivia, Jer's childhood friend who can't seem to leave him alone for more than two seconds. One time, Jer and I were at the movies together, but guess who coincidentally appeared and plonked herself down next to him? Yep, Olivia. Worse still, with their giggling and popcorn sharing, I felt like the third wheel. I was not having this again. So I just left for home in this random cab parked outside the theater. But bad luck. The driver doesn't know the way. He doesn't even have a phone. And I had to lend him mine for GPS. The guy snatched it out of my hand immediately. Rude. But wait, it was 9 p.m. already. Why did he still have shades on? And even wore a mask? Right then, I realized the car had passed the town's border. Stop! The car suddenly filled with smoke, and the last thing I thought was, he has eyes that were exactly like... Jer's. I woke up, finding myself in this old, cobwebby room. Where is this place? And that driver guy? I have to get out of here now! <clears throat> right at that moment, he came into the room with a smile. Don't you recognize me? Will you have another dance with me? Cause I'd love that. What is happening right now? What he just said? Did that mean he's the actual masked knight? Maybe that's why I don't feel connected to Jeremiah. Why did Jer lie to me then? So many questions popped up in my head. Then suddenly I heard a car stop outside. That guy immediately went to check. This could be my chance of escaping. By the time I got downstairs, I saw the driver guy talking to Jeremiah. So I hid behind the door and watched on. Cameron, just stop this. Getting revenge on our father is one thing, but this is a step too far. Take Viv back to her family now and end this. I know this looks bad, but trust me, I'd never hurt Viv. I didn't mean for her to fall into the pool. That's why I jumped in to save her. But I need her as bait to show the world what that jerk Gregory is like. He doesn't deserve to be her father. <gasps> I muzzled myself in shock. Gregory is their father? And that Cameron guy was the one saving me, not Jer? Don't you forget who abandoned us when Mum had a close brush with death, then took all our business and properties, even our home, leaving us helpless? That jerk deserves all he gets. I was trying to process it all when another car arrived. Gregory's. I quickly hid under the stairs before he walked in with a bunch of bodyguards. Cameron, Jeremiah, my sons, haven't you grown up so fast? Cut to the chase, give us back the business and what's rightfully ours, then we'll let your stepdaughter go. Huh, <laughs> indeed, like father like sons. Very smart, but still amateurs, my boys. You see, all that girl is to me is an obstacle blocking my way to the inheritance. So please. Be my guest and take care of that little Miss Annoying. Aren't you afraid we'll expose everything you just said? And who's gonna believe you now? Jacqueline is mesmerized by me, so she'd believe anything I say. <laughs> that snake. How dare he speak of my mom like that? Unable to hold in my rage, I jumped out of my hiding spot and screamed at Gregory. What did you say about my mom? You slimy, lying traitor! Nice talking to you all, but the fun has to end here. Goodbye. The guards lunged forward, about to tie me up when the cops smashed the door coming in and behind them was... Mom! Stop right there. How dare you do this to my daughter? Gregory's face turned paler than a ghost as he mumbled out, Jackie, honey, 
why you're here. Um, but just in time to save our baby, Vivian. Cut the act. I already heard everything you said. And you're going to jail for a long time. Then the cops led him and took his crook guards away. Seeing Mum, I was so happy I rushed to hug her. Turns out, her investigations of the pool incident led her to Cameron. So when she confronted him, he eventually told her everything. That's how they came up with a plan to catch Gregory red-handed. Mum and the cops had been waiting in ambush around here for Gregory to show up. Then, well, you know the rest. A lot has happened in three months. Mum finally finished all the legal stuff, so now the property Gregory had merged with hers to gain her trust is now signed back over to Cam and Jeremiah. I realized that being wealthy isn't a bad thing, especially as it means with influence like this, I can help other less fortunate people and really make a difference. Now I help Mum with her business and her charity work, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm proud of my hard-working, amazing Mum, and I'm proud of who I am. And guess what? I now have real friends who like me for me. As for Jeremiah, well, he apologized about everything. He used to fear his brother was going to hurt me, so he lied to protect me. We made up, of course, and became the best of friends. I'm not sure I can say the same about his brother, though. He did everything he could to beg for my forgiveness, but I just can't. Then one day, Jer asked me to come by his home to visit his mom. She begged me not to think badly of her boys, especially Cameron. He's in love with you, you know? He always talks about you, and how he wishes things would have been different. Oh boy, her words are starting to have an effect on me. When I walked out the door, I saw Cameron sitting on the porch. He turned and looked at me, and I felt my heart pound for my grey-eyed, masked night. So, taking a deep breath, I walked over to him, just as the sun was setting. It was a normal Monday morning. I was standing by my locker when this Layla girl walked over, leaned against the locker next to mine, and talked to me in this sultry voice. Hi, Ansem. Do you have any plans after school? I looked around in confusion. Huh? Was she talking to me? Usually girls like Layla didn't talk to guys like me. I mean, come on, look at her. She's the hottest girl in school. While I'm Felix, <laughs> just your average-looking nerdy guy. I awkwardly replied, Oh, hi, uh, I'm just doing my homework after school. Bye. Then I left her there, dumbfounded. But it didn't end there. At the end of school, she approached me again and asked, Do you want to hang out with me? Followed by a wink. Uh, no thanks, uh, I really have to finish my paper on the French Revolution. Then I walked off. Man, did she really want to hang out with me? <laughs> no way. She must have lost a bet or something. Even on the next day, Layla, one more time, made a beeline for me with this scary, determined look on her face while I was chatting with my friends. And in a serious tone, she said, Look, Felix. Do you want to be my boyfriend? What? All my friends started to cheer. I was so embarrassed that I shooed them away to get some privacy with Layla. Um, I'm flattered, but no. She scowled at me. Excuse me? Do you realize that I'm Layla Hall, the prettiest and most popular girl in this entire school? Not to mention a member of the cheerleading team? Ugh, cheerleaders are so dramatic. I calmly replied, Sorry, but you're just not my type. She shouted back, What? I'm everybody's type! I just shrugged and left. My god, that was awkward. But at least she got the hint now, right? Well, wrong. Because that's when the trouble just began. Firstly, it was this flood of junk emails and newsletters. Then strange phone calls from the spa and nail salon. Asking if I had made appointment for the day, which I obviously didn't. On top of that, there's a fake Facebook account that started spreading unflattering pictures of me around, picking my nose in French class pulling this weird tongue-out concentration face as I checked over my essay. There was even a slow-mo clip of me chewing like a camel as I enjoyed my burger. Man, I was an ugly eater. While I was scrolling through these pics, Layla jumped out at me with a big smirk on her face. Be my boyfriend, then the pranks will stop. Right, uh, of course it was her. Didn't she have better things to do? I shook my head and said, no thanks. This still beats being with an annoying girl like you. Then, a few days later, as I walked into school, I noticed that everyone was giving me dirty looks. Was my shirt inside out or something? Nope. So, what was the problem? I asked some of my friends, and, geez, 
Layla told everyone that I kissed her, then ghosted her. She's a real-life Harley Quinn. Hot, but totally crazy. Only a lunatic like the Joker could love her. I'd had enough of her antics. I couldn't let her make me look like the bad guy for something I didn't do. So, at lunch, I charged over to her table and yelled in her face. Are you crazy? Why can't you understand that I don't like you? Then I shouted so everyone could hear me. Hey, listen. This rumor about me kissing and ghosting Layla is a total lie. She made it all up because I refused to date her. So please, save your dirty looks for someone else. Thank you. Layla shoved past me and ran out of there. Ugh, okay, maybe I was a little harsh. But you'd brought it on yourself, princess. Then during French class, she was absent, but no one knew where she went. Was it maybe because of me? Nah, probably not. But as I was walking home, I spotted her sitting alone on a swing in the playground. Just go, Felix. This girl only brings trouble, I thought to myself. But oh man, she looked so sad. So the next thing I knew, I was walking over and sat on the swing next to her. I asked, why weren't you in French class? Just leave me alone. Stop pretending you care. Look, I took a deep breath, then continued. I'm sorry for yelling at you in front of the whole school. That, that wasn't cool. But what you did to me wasn't cool either. Shall we call it even? Layla stayed quiet for a bit, but then she nodded and smiled at me. Well, that wasn't so bad, right? So from then onward, everything was fine between us. She even smiled at me in the hallway. Whenever I saw Layla, this warm feeling came over me, and I couldn't stop grinning. Once, I even spent my entire lunch break trapezing around school just so I could catch a glimpse of her face. Oh boy, I think I've fallen for Layla. But why now? I tried to ignore these feelings, hoping they'd eventually go away. But then Valentine's Day came along, and Layla, being the popular girl she is, received enough roses to open a florist. Ugh, how annoying. I needed to do something. So after school, I went to her house with some chocolates and a teddy bear. As soon as she opened the door, I blurted out, I know I'm a big dumb idiot. Rejecting you was a huge mistake. Please, will you be my valentine? I stood there red-faced and prepared for rejection. But she just snatched the gift out of my hands, then said, Yeah, okay then. Oh my god, I couldn't believe it. Me, your regular nerdy guy, was dating the most popular girl in school. Love is really unpredictable. I was amazed at how open she was to my nerdy stuff. She even watched The Mandalorian with me and cooed whenever she saw Baby Yoda. But the one thing that didn't gel so well between us was, yep, you guessed it, studying. Layla didn't seem to care about her grades, and I didn't want her to fail, so I offered to be her tutor. But she was constantly yawning and staring out of the window whenever we started studying. Felix, I have an idea. Why don't you do my homework for me? In the meantime, I can go to cheerleading practice as we have an important contest coming up, and it means the world to me, just like your math quizzes do to you. What? Was she serious? My God, I hated cheating like this. But she gave me that puppy-eyed look, and me being the sucker I am, I agreed. Thanks, Felix. You're the best. She kissed me on the cheek, then immediately passed me a huge pile of homework. I asked her why she had so much, and she explained that because she didn't understand it, she let them pile up. But hold on. Why did she have Spanish? She was in French class with me, not Spanish. But she just shrugged and said her parents forced her to study it outside of school. Oh, my poor little pumpkin. One day, like usual, I stopped by her place to pick up her homework, but she wasn't home. That was odd. Today wasn't cheerleading practice, so where could she be? I looked through the stack that she asked her mom to give me and saw some Spanish worksheets. So I said to her mom, Oh, she must be in her Spanish lesson, right? Her mom looked a bit confused and laughed. <laughs> you know Layla. She's far too stubborn to agree to extra classes. Huh? So the papers weren't hers? Then whose it was? And why? Suddenly I felt this uncomfortable feeling itching under my skin. I decided to confront her later at school. Then the next day I was walking through the hallway looking for Layla when I suddenly heard some guys cheering, something about getting an A in Spanish. Wait a minute, did he say Spanish? I turned to see who it was, and to my shock it was Hector, the captain of the soccer team. Hector was popular for being all handsome and everything, but also for sucking at school. Someone must have done his homework for him, and you guessed it, yeah. This someone was me. Ah, it all made sense now. Layla and Hector must be a couple. They may have been hot stuff, but they both sucked at studying. So she was using me to do both of their homework. It all made much more sense now. None of this relationship was real. It was all just an act. And no way was I letting them get away with this. I had a perfect plan to expose them. During lunch, I sat down at the table closest to Hector. Then I went into lovey-dovey overload with Layla. I fed her cheese fries, then I stroked her hair and loudly told her how soft it was. 
I quickly glanced over at Hector for his reaction, but nothing. He seemed more interested in her burger than her. Layla raised an eyebrow at me. Um, are you okay? You're acting really weird. I laughed loudly, then placed my arms around her, then said, well, um, it was actually more like shouting. Oh, because you're so cute! But huh? Why was there still no reaction from Hector? He and his friends even cheered, and on his way out of the canteen, he gave me a thumbs up. Layla didn't look phased at all either. Man, somebody call the Academy, because these two deserved an Oscar. My plan was a massive fail. Ugh, this was so frustrating. I fell silent, and Layla noticed and gave me this quizzing look. Something is definitely off. You're being really strange. Okay, if she wanted to know, then fine. So I blurted out. I know that the Spanish papers belong to Hector. You're together and you're just using me to do all your homework. I'm not stupid, you know. Nice meeting you, but please don't ever talk to me again. Then I left without saying a word. Well, that's the end of my story. A rather sad one, right? I would be lying if I said I wasn't feeling down about it. I truly do love her. <laughs> Whatever. I'm going to college in a few months and I'll get to meet a cute, geeky girl who won't trick me into doing some other dude's homework. <sighs> Oh, uh, sorry guys, someone's calling me. My god, it's Layla. What does she want? We're done. Stop calling. What? Fine. I promise you'll leave me alone after this? Okay, wait. I'm coming downstairs. Uh, oh my god. Layla's at my front door and she insists to not leave unless I have a talk with her. Ugh. Don't move, everyone. I'll tell you every detail as soon as I'm back. Jesus, guys, you won't believe what Layla's just told me. The thing is that her cheerleading team had to practice a lot for upcoming contests, which means they couldn't study as much. Therefore, they had to find someone who was willing to do their homework so their grades wouldn't slip. That's when Layla came up with the plan to win me over as her boyfriend. The flirting, the pranks, <laughs> they were all part of her plan. That was the truth. But Layla didn't know about the Spanish worksheets, because her teammate Harper gave them to her. Turns out Hector is Harper's boyfriend. Didn't see that coming, right? But I was still super mad at Layla, because she still used me. Then Layla took out some papers and showed them to me. Huh? It was homework with all B's on them. Then she told me, Okay, I admit that at first I didn't like you. I only approached you to take advantage of you. But then I actually fell for you as I got to know you better, okay? So I stopped giving you my homework and did it on my own. So, her feelings for me were real too? I couldn't believe it. Eventually I forgave her and now we're happier than ever. I must say, when Layla first talked to me, I thought she was this crazy girl like Harley Quinn, who I could never like, but I was wrong. Turns out I'm the one who's crazy about her. So, I guess I have more in common with the Joker than I first thought. <laughs>
Ahem, that's not how you talk to your mistress? He rolled his eyes at me and muttered under his breath. Oof, please, you're not my mistress. You're just my employee's spoiled daughter. Can you believe the cheek of that man? Ugh! Anyway, I'm Maya, the beloved daughter of the CEO of Ander X Corp. And that jerk is Blade, my father's private pilot. I don't know why my father likes him so much. He's sarcastic, abrupt, and crude. The only reason I was flying with him in the first place was because he was going to pick my father up from a meeting in Rio, which coincidentally, I was in need of a weekend getaway under the hot tropical sunlight. So two birds, one stone, huh? But yeah, this is what I got instead. Oops, how embarrassing. Why was my stomach growling like this? Hearing that, Blade immediately opened his backpack and took out a sandwich. I reached out to take it, but what? He stuffed it straight into his mouth and grinned at me as he chewed. Fine, he could keep his lame food. At that moment, we heard a loud noise in the sky. We looked up and saw a rescue helicopter. I jumped up and down, waved and shouted to catch its attention. After a while, I turned around and saw Blade doing something weird. What on earth are you doing? Come here and shout! Now is not the time to build tiny stick houses or whatever, mister. But he just rolled his eyes and carried on. How dare he? I jumped in and kicked hard at the pile of twigs he was stacking. Jeez, he sure looked annoyed. Why are you looking at me like that? It's you who keeps doing all that nonsense this time. Your shouts are useless here. This fire was our only chance of sending that helicopter a distress signal. And you just ruined it. Then he stormed off, leaving me all alone. So the rescue helicopter flew away, and our survival journey continued, unfortunately. Hey, slow down. How long does it take to this stupid brook? And guess what he said to me? We only have one bottle of water, so if you don't want to die of thirst, I suggest you shut up and keep walking. Blah, blah, blah. But we went on and on and on and still couldn't find the brook even though the sun had already set. So we had to create a makeshift tent with our parachute and the two of us gradually fell asleep. Early the next morning, a raging hunger awakened me. Blade was still sleeping, so I crept past him and rummaged in his backpack. Oh, the jerk was hiding an apple from me. I was about to take a big bite out of it, when suddenly a hand snatched it away. Ugh! I can't stand it anymore! It's just an apple! Why do you... Huh? When did Blade get so hairy? Wait, was it... A monkey? Ah! I screamed loudly, and the monkey ran away with my breakfast. Blade rushed over to me. You know what, princess? That was the only food we had left. Then he pulled my hand to chase after the monkey. And guess what we found? O-M-G. There was our helicopter next to the brook. We were so happy that we ran over and hugged each other tightly. We're alive! And we have enough food for a week in there. Oh, wait. He was still on my blacklist, so I immediately pushed him away. He scratched his head and his face turned as red as a tomato. Hmm, I suppose he was kinda adorable sometimes, but I was still mad at him. As the days passed by, we started running low on food. Blade remained persistent and continued trying to make contact on the radio. Finally, he detected the frequency and, eek, we got a reply. They told us to wait a little longer and the next morning a helicopter would come to the rescue. At last, this was our last night in this awful place. Blade was so cold and unpleasant at the beginning, but over the past difficult days, he seemed to have opened his heart and really showed his warm side. We actually spent hours chatting that night, and I listened to him talk about his tough childhood in the orphanage and his dream of flying freely in the sky. Well, that's great! I wish I had a dream to dedicate myself to. Oh, you don't have any? Actually, yes. Since my mom passed away, my father started working even more. 
I longed to have my happy family life back, but it wasn't to be. Maybe I will get that again, but this time with my fiancé. Really? If so, he's a lucky guy. Huh? What did Blade mean by that? I suddenly felt my face flush. Honestly, speaking of my fiancé, I just found out by accident that the luxurious life he claims to have, all the houses and cars, are all fake. I'm a bit confused, but I haven't asked him directly yet. Just like that, our stories continued until dawn. Ugh, thank goodness, I'm finally out of that awful forest! Maya, Maya, are you okay? I've been worried sick about you. Ch- Chase? Oh, you two know each other? Chase is my fiancé. Uh, um, it's a long story, but I'll tell you later. Now let's get going. That night, we stayed at a hotel before heading home. And oh boy, it sure was good to be pampered again. I was sitting in our suite room, picking up my room service order and waiting for Chase. Hmm, what was taking him so long? Feeling down being all alone, I found myself leaving the room and looking for Blade. As I was walking along the hallway, I accidentally bumped into a room service guy and caused him to drop his walkie-talkie. Watch it. Don't mess it up. Hmm. That sounded a lot like... Nah, it can't be. What made my mistress come all the way over to my room? Um, about the things I told you yesterday regarding Chase, I didn't realize you knew him, so please keep it a secret. Maya, actually I think you need to know this. Suddenly his phone rang, so he answered it. The conversation sounded serious. Then he said to me, The airport cameras have been checked and someone tampered with the helicopter. They're going to send me the footage. We both watched the video and saw a strange young man approaching it before takeoff. Hang on. I recognized that man. He's the room service guy I just bumped into. Uh-oh. I had a bad feeling about this. We need to find him now. Huh? What was that smell? Ew. It was irritating my nose. I asked Blade if he smelt it too and he just shrugged and said all he could smell was my perfume. Then there was a clicking sound at the door. We rushed over to it, but it was jammed. Blade called the front desk, but no one answered. So I took the phone off him and called my room in the hope Chase would pick up. But he didn't. I started coughing. There was definitely a weird smell in here. So I rushed into the bathroom, soaked the towels, and passed one to Blade to cover his mouth and nose with. Then I grabbed the vase off the table and threw it at the window. Smash! Wow, nice shot! Luckily, we were only on the second floor, so with Blade's help, we easily jumped onto the ground. Then we rushed to reception to verify the identity of the suspicious hotel staff, and ran straight into... Chase! Are you two okay? What's with the gas leak? Chase worriedly asked us, then he turned to scold the hotel manager. Huh? How did he know about that? Blade and I shared confused looks, but neither of us said anything out loud. It was horrible, Chase. I was so scared. Please stay with me. I don't want to be alone. I pretended to cry as I leaned on his shoulder. Then, while Chase was talking to reception, I turned to Blade and asked him to call the police to find the suspicious hotel staff instead. That afternoon, before checking out, the police called to say they'd arrested the suspect. So all three of us went to the station. As soon as the police led the room service guy out, he immediately pointed at Chase and said, He's the one who hired me. Chase gave a shocked look, denied the accusation, and threatened to sue him if he continued with this slander. Stop the act, Chase. I checked, and I know you used my card to send huge payments to the same person. That person. All I did was love you with all of my heart. So why did you try and harm me? No, I never wanted you to be hurt. It's just... I... Why were you always with him? What do you mean? I hate you, Blade. Why do you always stick your nose in my business and ruin everything? I'd almost reached my goal, then you appeared and messed everything up. So, 
It turns out Chase was targeting Blade, not me. The two of them grew up in the same orphanage. As a kid, Chase was a crafty boy who took delight in deceiving others for fun. So the nuns assigned Blade the task of watching over him. Blade just wanted the best for his friend, so he followed Chase's every step and tried to stop him from all his petty theft plans and love scams. So Chase grew to despise Blade, and when they both left the orphanage, they lost contact with each other. Coincidentally, one time, when Chase arrived at my home to pick me up, he saw Blade. So fearing that he'd expose his underprivileged background, he planned to get rid of him forever. I don't care how much money you have, I already know your flashy wealth was all made up, but I thought you had your reasons and weren't comfortable enough to tell the truth. But it didn't matter, as I still wanted to be with you. However, what I find unacceptable is your deceitful and cruel nature. I never want to see you ever again. I burst into tears, and Blade comforted me. As for Chase, he was still begging for me to forgive him as the police dragged him away. It took me a long time to come to terms with what Chase did, but luckily for me, I have Blade to look out for me. Yep, that's right, we're now an official couple. Finally, I have the kind, loyal, action man boyfriend of my dreams. We sure do make a good couple, don't you think? Bye, Auntie! I waved to her. I promise I'll be fine at home alone. That's good. I'll be back soon, B. Then she left. That's my Auntie Anna. I was staying with her while my parents were on vacation. I was about to walk back into the living room when the doorbell rang, so I immediately ran to the door and looked through the peephole. Ah! It was Mom! I quickly opened the door and rushed out to hug her tightly. Mommy, how come you're back so early? Mom stroked my hair and softly said, Oh, sweetie, I came to pick you up. How can I leave my little princess alone? Now hurry up and pack your things. I gave a confused look. But Auntie Anna's at the grocery store. Shouldn't we wait for her? She shook her head. No, sweetie, I already called her. So we quickly packed my things, and Mom led me outside to a rather old car, which was completely different from our usual BMW. Mom, where's Dad? This isn't our car, I asked her. She knelt in front of me and smiling said, Daddy's waiting for us at the beach. It's going to be lots of fun. I jumped up and down excitedly. Yay! I couldn't wait to build sandcastles and splash in the sea. This was so cool! On the way, I must have fallen asleep, as when I opened my eyes, it was already dark outside. I got out of the car and looked around. Hmm, where was the ocean? All I saw was some small house in an unfamiliar neighborhood. Beatrice, this is our new home. Just you and me from now on. Mom's sudden words totally woke me up. Mom, why? What about Dad? I stammered. Listen, I'm sorry. I can't explain it to you at the moment. You're too young to understand. I had so many questions flying around my head, but looking at Mom's sad face, I knew I shouldn't ask her anymore. The next morning, I woke up excited and curious about our new beginning here. I opened the curtain and saw a group of kids my age playing across the street. So, without thinking, I rushed outside to join them. Hello, I'm Beach. Suddenly, my mom came out of nowhere, a frantic look on her face as she shouted, I told you to stay inside, and pulled me back home. Everyone was gawping at us, including the man who lived across the street. It was so embarrassing. As soon as the door slammed shut, in a serious tone, she said, We just moved here. You shouldn't make friends with strangers that fast. And don't talk too much about yourself, okay? Mom had never minded me playing with other kids before. So why now? This didn't make any sense. After that, she only let me out of the house for school. And she always kept an eye on me. 
so that's why I couldn't make any friends here. I resented her so much. I was so lonely. One good thing about it was she didn't have any house rules, so I could spend all day watching cartoons while eating junk food, and she didn't mind at all. This was great, as before we moved here, Mom and Dad never let me do stuff like this. But eventually, I got sick of those junk foods. I felt kind of icky. I longed for Mom's special spaghetti with crab sauce, so I begged her to make it. At first, she refused, saying that she was very busy. So I kept on whining until she finally agreed. Later, I went to the kitchen for dinner, and the room was an utter chaos. Pots and pans everywhere. Mom looked messy, too, as she passed me a plate of spaghetti and meatballs instead of her signature dish. Well, okay, it looked delicious anyway, so I took a full fork of it as Mom watched on. Poof! Water! I need water! Gosh, it's so salty! Mom quickly replaced my pasta plate with a box of fried chicken and said, Today I'm busy, so I was a bit distracted. Sorry, honey. Her awkwardness made me laugh. Nah, it's okay, Mom. Mom did seem really busy lately, as her phone was always buzzing. The calls even came late at night when I was asleep, so she always quietly went out to answer it. Guess it's hard being a single mom after all, so I tried to be more understanding. And just like that, time passed. Staying inside and having no friends became the norm for me. Still... I often sat by the window and stared longingly at the kids playing outside. Then one time, when I was doing this, Mom appeared and asked me if I wanted to go to the nearby amusement park. Wow, could there be anything better than this? I leaped up, clapped excitedly, then wrapped my arms around her. Honestly, the park was pretty small, and everything seemed kind of tired looking. But this didn't matter, as it was the best day I'd ever had. Mom never used to like rides or games, but today was different. She even got excited when she saw the beanbag throwing stall. She knocked the tins down in one go and won me this giant cuddly bunny. I've never seen her have fun like this before. My mom is so cool. Afterward, mom left me sitting on a bench and she went off to get some ice cream. Suddenly, I saw her rushing back and without ice creams. She pulled on my hand and in an urgent tone said, We need to go home. We're moving. So we packed up our things and left in a rush. I kept on asking mom what was going on, but she dodged my questions. During the car journey, I heard her mutter to herself, We're going somewhere new. It'll be exciting. A new adventure. Yes, it'll be fine this time. I may have been young, but I wasn't stupid. I knew she was hiding something but she's my mom and I didn't want to upset her by bugging her with questions. So I stayed quiet and eventually fell asleep. Once again, I woke up in an unfamiliar place and stared out of the window. I wasn't as bothered about this place as I was about the last. I didn't want to get too attached to it as I didn't know how long it'd be before mom made us move again. But there was one thing that bothered me. Across the street was a man looking straight at our new house. Hmm... He looked identical to our previous neighbor. Maybe he'd just moved here too? What a coincidence. I mentioned the man to mom, but she told me she didn't know him, and then sternly told me never to interact with him. At school, I was the strange kid who didn't talk to anyone. The older I got, the worse this felt. And the other kids laughed at me, and I heard them call me weird behind my back. I felt so lonely and depressed. So at home, I often just sat by the window with a book and tried to pretend that the adventures I was reading about were happening to me. <sighs> Worse still, Mom was acting even odder than usual. The other day when I got home from school, I found her chucking perfectly good food out of the fridge. Some were even brand new. I asked her what she was doing and she replied, It's gone off, so I'm getting rid of it. Then she started scrubbing the fridge. The smell won't go. Why won't it go? What was she talking about? Everything seemed fine. What's happening? Then I discovered that mom often left the house late at night and didn't return till dawn. I knew if I asked her about this, she wouldn't say anything. So that night, I snuck out and followed her. Mom was wearing dark clothes with a hat and a big scarf covering her face, even though it's not that cold outside. Hmm. 
Why the disguise? Then, can you believe it? I spotted her going over to the neighbor's house and cuddling him on his porch. I jumped out of the darkness and shouted, Mom, what's going on? I thought we weren't meant to talk to this man. She gave me an alarmed look. I... At that moment, Mom received a text. In a panicked voice, she said to me, Beatrice, we have to go. Now! I'll explain everything later, I promise. Right after that, the mysterious man waved at us and told us to get in his car. Then he sped through the night. After regaining my senses, I turned to my mom and asked, I hope this explanation is good. Um, actually, we're in danger, honey. It's your dad. He's an imposter. I only figured this out when I was on vacation with him and I've been running from him ever since. What? I'd never suspected my dad of being someone else. It made no sense. Then, through sobs, my mom continued to say that my real dad was actually a member of a secret organization, but he had been missing for a while, and now the organization was after us. She often received anonymous messages and calls threatening her. She didn't want me talking to strangers in case they were spies. And those times when she threw all the food out was because she'd received texts threatening to poison the food in our house. She wiped her tears away then said, This is Joe. We went to college together and he's been such a help. We fell in love, but I didn't dare tell you because I was afraid you wouldn't understand. I looked at this Joe guy. I don't know. There was something off about him. But maybe I was just being paranoid. I mean, he had helped mom out, right? Ah, what's that? Ever since I found out about the secret organization, I've been kind of jittery. What if they suddenly turn up and take me and my mom away? I know mom's worried too, as she seems so distant. I just want to make things better for us both. Then Christmas arrived. It was quite the special one, as for the first time since we went into hiding, we had guests. Well, one guest, Joe. We raised our glasses for a Merry Christmas, but instead of putting it down, my mom gulped it back in one go. Mom, are you drinking tonight? I asked skeptically. Of course, my dear. It's Christmas. Let me tell you, I'm no less than a man when it comes to drinking. <laughs> I chewed on my lip as I thought about this. Mom had an alcohol allergy, and at the most, she only had tiny sips. Suddenly, a thought came to mind. Maybe Dad wasn't the imposter after all. Maybe it had been Mom all along. She enjoyed the roller coaster rides, though to my recollection, Mom was afraid of heights. She couldn't cook, she now loved Joe, a strange man, and she could down alcohol without being ill. If this was true, then who could I trust now? Something wasn't right. I could feel it in my gut. So the next day, I secretly went to the cops instead of school as usual. Then I found out something crazy. Turns out, my real parents had been looking for me for over the past six years. O-M-G. As for the mother I was living with, who was she? I tried to stay calm while waiting for the police to contact my parents first. And as soon as they got there, the three of us broke down in tears. That's when my real mom told the whole truth. Actually, she had a twin sister called Linda. No one had ever known about Linda, as due to her debt problems, my grandpa rejected her and forbade her to ever show up in front of anyone in the family. But my mom couldn't disown her own twin, so she secretly gave her money. Then one time, Linda was asking for too much that mom turned her down. Unexpectedly, she came and took me away to pressure my mom to send her more money. During that time, my mom kept transferring her money to make sure I'd be provided for. She hadn't given any information about Linda to the cops, though, because mom still wanted to talk to her first, though, so that her sister wouldn't end up in trouble. Wow, this was a lot to take in. After that... Mom ran over to Dad, who's in line to talk to the police. She grabbed his hand and begged him to give Auntie Linda a chance. Um, as you see, I missed out on having a normal childhood because of my aunt, and what she did was wrong. But there's a part of me that will always care for her, as she raised me for all these years. And my heart urged me to say, 
Dad, I didn't want to turn her in either. My dad looked at me hesitantly, but in the end, he nodded in agreement. So we decided to deal with it ourselves without the intervention of the police. Then, the next day as planned, I was in the front yard with my fake mom when her identical twin marched up to our house and confronted her. Once my Auntie Linda got over the initial shock, she confessed everything to me. <sighs> it was sad, but glad that it's all over now. Mom paid off her sister's debts with one condition, that she would never, ever get near me again. Now I'm back home, with my actual parents. It's going to take some getting- I've made it! I'm on the paradise island of Koh Lanta, and I actually get to stay here at this luxurious beachside resort. Hey, I'm Achara, a 17-year-old girl from Krabby Town, Thailand. As amazing as this place is, I'm actually not here on vacation. Instead, I'm here to reunite with the boy I saved 10 years ago. I almost forgot he existed until last week when I came across a Facebook post by Thomas, a famous British swimmer, searching for the mystery girl who saved his life as a child. Thomas is currently in Thailand for business, so here I am, eager to finally see him again. I was waiting by the gate, when suddenly, sounds of rolling suitcases came from behind me. I turned around to see two girls about my age standing there. Hmm, who are they? Before I could say anything, the gate opened and a friendly woman invited us inside. According to Mrs. Danvish, Thomas's housekeeper, he had a training schedule in another city and wouldn't be back for a couple of days. Then she introduced us to each other. The short-haired girl is called Sarai, and the longer-haired girl is Kanda. Deary me, I must say that having three girls all claiming to be Thomas's savior came as a bit of a surprise. <laughs> but I'm sure the truth will come out in the wash. Until then, please all stay here and make yourselves comfortable. So, those two girls are pretending to be me? Unbelievable! But, no problem, Thomas would soon realize I was the one he was looking for and would kick those imposters out of here. I dropped my suitcase off in my room, then went downstairs for dinner. As soon as I sat down, Sarai spoke up. <clears throat> Stop acting! I know you two fakers are just pretending to be me so you can get your hands on Thomas's fortune. <laughs> You're the fake one! Curly hair and a mole? You really have done your study, huh? OMG, these two audacious girls were getting on my nerves. At that moment, Mrs. Danvish entered, followed by the waiter with a trolley full of the most delicious looking food I'd ever laid eyes on. Now that Mrs. Danvish was here, the two imposters immediately changed their frosty attitudes to their bright smiles and sweet as pie acts. <sighs> Ladies, please help yourselves to food and drink. Then tomorrow morning, after you've all been well rested, we shall have a little chat. Um, but how am I supposed to enjoy the food when I have these two vultures glaring at me? I quickly finished my meal, then rushed back to my room. I must be well prepared for tomorrow. The next morning, a maid escorted me out to the garden for breakfast. The other two girls were already there. On seeing me, Kanda scowled at me, while Sarai made a point of sawing her knife through her omelet. I was about to help myself to some breakfast, when suddenly Mrs. Danvish appeared and said, Morning, girls. I hope you're all well rested. She sat down, then continued. Now to the main point. I'm rather curious and was wondering where you first met Thomas. Easy. It was here on this island when I was 10 years old. I was collecting shells on the beach when I met him. Busted. I was only seven years old then, imposter. Gee, a careless move over there, Conda. Thomas clearly specified in an interview that he'd been eight years old and the girl who saved him was a year younger. Yes, I met Thomas when I was seven years old. At that time, my father was a helmsman. I often followed him here, and once I spotted Thomas sitting alone on the beach. Feeling bored waiting for my dad, I came to say hi and hang out with them the whole day. That afternoon, Thomas got a cramp while swimming and he would have drowned if it wasn't for me. I saved him, then my father and I took him to the hospital. Mrs. Danvish just listened silently, and when all three of us had finished answering, she said, Indeed, the girl in question was seven at the time. So, Conda. No, I just misremembered. See, I was only seven at the time. I could easily get confused. Mrs. Danvish didn't say anything more after this, but I saw this knowing look in her eyes. Then, that night at dinner, there were only two places at the table set, and Conda never made an appearance. Seems like things are getting serious. The next morning, I was making the most of my time here by lounging around on the beach. 
reading my favorite book, when someone blocked out the sun. I looked up to see Sarai smirking down at me. Enjoy yourself while you can, as you'll be the next to leave. As if! You may have memorized all the information from the newspapers, but that's not going to be enough to fool Thomas. You. I saw the fury in Sarai's eyes as she raised her hand to slap me. But, huh? Someone stopped her. Standing in front of me was a tall, handsome guy. Wow, who is he? Miss, violence is not the answer. <laughs> who are you to lecture me? Actually, I'm Eli, Thomas's assistant. Sarai tutted under her breath and then strutted off. Um, are you okay? I'm fine. I just don't know how someone has the nerve to lie like that. We continued talking as we strolled along the beach. Eli mentioned how I was exactly as Thomas had described me. Seeing as Eli seemed to be on my side, I took the chance to ask him more about Thomas, such as what his favorite foods, colors, and movies were. Yesterday I spoke to Thomas's housekeeper, Mrs. Danvish. She seems to know a lot about him, doesn't she? That's right. She was Thomas's nanny. Due to their busy schedules, Thomas's parents were often busy, so most of the time Mrs. Danvish was the one taking care of him. He's very fond of her. Then Eli showed me a picture of Mrs. Danvish hugging a smiley, young-looking Thomas. Oh, so he had blonde hair when he was little? I was so lost in thought, I didn't notice a rock and tripped over it. Eli immediately reached out to study me. Then he asked if I was okay. Oh my god, what happened to me? Why is my heart thudding like crazy? That night, Sarai and I were sitting in the dining room having a stare off as we waited for dinner. When suddenly, a man walked in holding two bouquets of sunflowers. Thomas! Oh wow, he looks even more handsome in real life. My best friend Dara should have been here to see this. I told her to come here, but she wouldn't listen to me. Before I had time to greet Thomas, Sarai rushed over and hugged him. Then she pretended to get all emotional. Finally, we're reunited. Not a day has passed when I haven't thought of you. Thomas awkwardly pushed her away, then scratched his head. Let's have dinner first and then talk about this later. The food looked delicious as always, but I had a job to do. Only, whenever I tried to say something to Thomas, that awful Sarai interrupted me. Since our first meeting, the image of a cute brown-haired boy has been imprinted on my heart. I noticed Thomas pause and exchange a knowing look with Eli. You mean blonde, right? She thinks you had brown hair because she's never seen you when you were a kid. And that just proves she's a fraud. Thomas looked at me stunned, then turned to Sarai in disappointment as she blurted out, It's not like that. Please hear me out. Without letting Sarai finish her sentence, Thomas sternly said, You know, I can totally sue you for impersonation and fraud. If you don't want to get in trouble, get out of here at once. Sarai looked like she was about to cry as she stuttered helplessly, then quickly got up and left. Thomas then grabbed my hand, smiled, and said, Finally, I found you. So he's weeded out the frauds. But why do I feel so guilty when I see his cheerful face? And what about Eli? Why do I find myself wishing it wasn't Thomas holding my hand right now? <sighs> the next morning, I took Thomas to my hometown and showed him around. We were walking along the shore of the Krabby River when I saw Dara waiting. There she is. I invited her to join us. This is Dara, my best friend. Dara, this is Thomas, the guy I was talking to you about. Right then, my phone started ringing. Excuse me, I've got to take this. Go ahead, guys. I'll be right back. I quickly left, but did not forget to wink at Dara and whisper to her. I did my best. Now it's your turn. I took a stroll around the area and came back to see Thomas sitting alone, looking off into the distance. Hmm, where did Dara go? Seeing me, he stood up and said, Dora had something to do, so she left early. We should leave, too. On our way back home, I couldn't help but ask Thomas, So, Dora told you everything, right? What do you mean? Oh, well, she did tell me about some interesting spots in the town. Oh, man, that means Thomas still has no clue? Silly Dora, I put so much effort into bringing him here. Oh, hey, Achara, this suddenly came to my mind. When you took me to the hospital back then, do you remember what flower you gave me? Flowers. Hmm, he got me sunflowers last time, so it must be... Of course I remember. I gave you a sunflower. I wanted to cheer you up. I was expecting a nod from Thomas, but to my surprise, 
He sighed and said, Actually, I just made that up. There were no flowers at all. Thomas's words got me wavered. I didn't want to end up in a position like this. Fine. If Dara chickened out of telling him the truth herself, then I guess I just have to do it. Thomas, I'm... I'm sorry. Actually... And so, I told Thomas the truth. The one who saved Thomas that day was Dara, not me. And she's in a pretty tough situation right now. Ever since her dad's accident that left him unable to take his boat out anymore, Dara's family were in terrible debt. So, when I saw the article where Thomas was searching for his savior, I tried to convince Dara to come forward, as he might be able to help out her family. But I can't do that. I can't let him see me in this awful state. He would presume I was only after his money. No matter how much I tried to convince her, Dara still refused to go and meet Thomas. And so I decided to disguise myself as Dara and approach you first. Then I planned to reunite you here. And she agreed to all that? No, she didn't. I carried things out all alone. I kept asking Dara for more information about the past and then spent all my savings on hair appointments and makeup to fake a mole like hers. Then I lied to my parents that I was participating in a summer camp and went to Koh Lanta. I also arranged to meet her here today, but I guess she's still not ready to talk to you. Actually, when I saw Dora, I felt this strange connection toward her. But seeing the way she left like that, maybe she doesn't want to see me again. Oh no, what had I done? I want to bring them together, not drive them apart. Are things really just going to end up like this? It's been three days since then, and now, here I am, nervously waiting for Dara in the airport lobby. I'd asked her to meet me here, but this doesn't look good. Does she really not even bother to say goodbye to me before I leave the country? Achora, seems like Dara isn't coming. I'm sorry, but we have to go. I gave a solemn sigh and pulled my suitcase, when suddenly I heard someone call, Wait up! Achara! I turned around and saw Dara running towards me. Oh boy, what a relief! I quickly hid away my smile and put on a sulky expression. Oh, you're here? Thought you wouldn't come. Anyway, my boyfriend and I are off to London to meet his family. They're really eager to meet his savior, right, babe? Thank you for coming to send me off. Dara gave an awkward look. Then she took my hand and led me over so she could whisper, Achara, can I talk to Thomas in private for a minute? Yes, my plan worked. I turned to Eli and gave a thumbs up. Then we rushed off and left Dara and Thomas to talk alone. <laughs> Did you really think I would let those two idiots give up on each other so easily? No way. I had discussed it with Thomas and planned to fake a cheesy farewell at the airport, and voila! Dara finally realized her feelings for Thomas in this hit-or-miss moment, and the two of them had a happy reunion. Yay! So, what about me, huh? Well, you don't have to worry, because I might have scored this cute, handsome assistant right here. <laughs> I was on my way to Julia's house for a study sesh, when out of nowhere, I found myself flying onto the ground. I was so stunned, I didn't even see the ball that had hit me, or the fact there was a cute guy rushing over to check if I was okay. He helped me up and apologized. Then he pulled a band-aid out of his bag. Oh my, who is he? I'd scraped my hand pretty badly, but I almost didn't mind because now I was face to face with a gorgeous guy. In fact, I was so busy staring at him and blushing that I didn't even notice Julia marching towards us. Um, what are you two doing? Turns out the cute guy was Callum, Julia's boyfriend. Ugh, Julia. Of course. Every nice thing is always hers. I'm Jenny, by the way, and that lucky girl is Julia. She's the daughter of the richest guy in town, Mr. Walsh. We're supposed to be friends, but we honestly have nothing in common. I mean, my family is pretty poor. It's not our fault, though. My dad sadly passed away. And so it's just me and my mom trying to make ends meet. Julia, on the other hand, has a silver spoon shoved down her throat. But fate still brought us together. I know it's kind of wrong, but that night I couldn't stop thinking about Callum. He now, in fact, gave me motivation for the next study session with bossy Julia. As maybe he would be there again. I even put on makeup and skipping on the way to her house the next day. But, well, it was all for nothing, because Callum was nowhere to be seen. Instead, 
I had to sit and listen to Julia go on and on about her trip to Paris. I pretended that I was okay, but actually, I always dreamed of visiting the city of light and gazing up at the Eiffel Tower ever since watching Emily in Paris. Dream on, Jenny. Anyway, Julia was incessant. She loved making me look like a fool, and even said, Aw, poor Jenny. Maybe one day you'll get to go to Paris. But until then, you can just look at all my photos. Honestly, why was she so cruel to me? Last year around my birthday, she'd even shown me a fashion magazine and asked me which dress I liked best. I thought she was buying gifts for me, but instead, she showed up at my party in the exact dress I pointed out. I couldn't believe it. She just winked at me and laughed, and I seriously wanted to scream at her. Anyway, after looking at about one billion Paris pics, Mr. Walsh appeared. He looked happy to see us sitting so close and studying together. If only he knew the truth. But I had to pretend I had a lot of fun with Julia and helping her study, at least for his sake. Mr. Walsh was a good friend of our family, and ever since my dad passed away, he'd been looking out for me, and was even paying my school fees. I couldn't let him down. But you know what? I actually started to get excited to go over to Julia's now, as the thought of bumping into Callum again gave me butterflies. I even got myself a new hairstyle. But he was never there, and I always left feeling disappointed. Then one time, after school, it started to rain dogs and cats, and I had to run for it. Then suddenly, I felt an umbrella over my head. Guess what? It was Callum coming to the rescue. It was like something out of a romantic movie. He even offered me a lift home. My heart was racing so hard, I was afraid he'd hear it. I just sat there in silence, dripping rain all over his clean car. I even caught him looking over at me a few times and my heart felt like it was going to leap out of my chest. He pulled up at my house, so I was about to get out when he touched my arm and said, Can I get your number? I was confused. I mean, wasn't he Julia's boyfriend? He then explained that he was just hired to be her fake boyfriend so that all the flirty boys would get out of her way. Wow, I couldn't believe it. He asked me to keep it a secret, as Julia would end us both if this story got out. Okay, it all made sense now. That's why he never came over to her house. I felt so happy. Over the next few days, Callum and I chatted a lot on the phone. And then eventually, he asked me out on a date. We went to the fun fair, and right away he held my hand. It made me feel so special, and I never wanted him to let go. We were having so much fun. Then a familiar voice pierced the air. Well, well, well. Isn't that my dear friend, Jenny? I felt dread rush through my whole body. We turned around. And there was Julia and her girl gang all standing there with their arms crossed. Callum dropped my hand and rushed to Julia's side. It was all her, babe. You gotta see the messages she sent. She's been flirting with me for weeks. It's pathetic. Whoa, was he for real? A second ago he was about to lean in for a kiss. And now he was bad-mouthing me? How could he be so two-faced? I tried to explain to Julia but she wouldn't listen. She just called me a traitor in front of everyone and told all her friends to lock up their boyfriends in case I try it on with one of theirs next. I was devastated. Everyone was staring at me and judging me. Ugh, if only I could vanish into thin air right now. And as I was thinking about where I could escape to, a guy appeared, grabbed my wrist, and pulled me away. It was Stefan, the guy who lived across the road from me. I didn't understand why he helped me, but I was so grateful that he did. He walked me home and tried to cheer me up by saying how his mom used to love our bakery so much and that the carrot cake my mom made was his mom's fave. This made me smile, thinking back on all those happy times in our family bakery. When my dad had died, we'd had to sell it to pay off some debt, and life had become quite difficult. Luckily, Mr. Walsh was helping out, but after what just happened with Julia, I wasn't sure I'd be able to face him. The next day at school, everyone was staring at me. I couldn't even find a place to sit at lunch. What had I done? I'd ruined everything. And then it got worse. My phone beeped. It was Mr. Walsh. He said he was so disappointed in me and that I no longer needed to come and tutor his daughter. I wanted to cry, and at the same time I felt so much relief. But then I read on and he said, I'm sorry, but I can't keep my promise anymore. I'll continue to subsidize your school fees, but you'll have to figure something out for college good luck. My heart plummeted. Not only had I been shunned by everyone at school and backstabbed by Callum, 
But now the door to college was being slammed in my face, too. What would I do? My life was over. I felt so sick. I just walked out of the canteen and went home. I didn't dare go to school over the next few days. I was miserable. And just when I'd given up all hope, there was a knock at my door. It was Callum. What was he doing here? He said he was sorry for what had happened and that he missed me so much. Then he asked me if I'd be interested in being his secret girlfriend. What in the world? I was so angry, I wanted to slam the door in his face. But he was fast enough to catch my hand, which took me aback. At that exact moment, Stefan happened to walk past. Seeing me standing there with Callum, his face changed and he immediately walked away. Oh, no. I definitely couldn't let him misunderstand anything about me anymore. He's the only friend I had left. I yanked my arm away from Callum and chased after Stefan. I finally caught up with him and blurted out how I'd been feeling like the whole world was against me and that I didn't know what to do. He told me to calm down, then we went to sit on a bench in the park, as he let me confide everything in him. By the time I finished talking, I was on the verge of tears. Then he said, Listen, Jenny, you're better than this. Don't dim to fit in with those people at your school. Good people will see you for the real you. You're strong, and you can get through anything. I know you can. He was right. I was better than this. I didn't need to sink as low as Julia and her friends, and I certainly didn't need to rely on Mr. Walsh's money. I'd figure this out by myself, like I always did. So I applied for a part-time job at a coffee shop. Earning my own money felt so good. Suddenly I felt free, and I knew everything was going to be okay. But then one day when I was working, Julia and her gang came in. They still weren't over what happened, and in front of everyone, they brought up what I'd done to humiliate me. And they even recorded it, and I couldn't stop shaking. This was too much. That's when I threw a cup of coffee all over Julia and ran out of there. Julia shouted after me that she was going to tell my mom everything I'd done. Without a doubt, Julia really did it. She even sent my mom photos of me and Callum at the fair. And well, my mom didn't take it well. I rushed home to try and explain after mom yelled at me over the phone. But then I couldn't find mom anywhere. I called her phone and a man answered. He said my mom was in a hospital after she fainted? Oh dear good God! I got to the hospital immediately and found out that she had collapsed from shock. But thankfully she was okay. She had to stay in the rest of the day to be monitored. So I went to get us both a cup of coffee. That's when I saw him. Callum. He was in the ward next door sitting with some girl. I almost dropped the coffee out of shock. They looked close. I waited until he'd left, and then I went to ask the girl if Callum was her boyfriend. Well, turns out, they'd been dating for two years already. So he was triple cheating? The girl deserved to know the truth, so I took a deep breath and told her everything. She was so upset. We decided to get our own back. So the girl called Callum and asked him to come back. As soon as he arrived, we confronted him and got the truth once and for all. He was never Julia's real boyfriend. In fact, here's the shocking part. He was hired by Julia to pretend to date me and ruin my life. Apparently, she was jealous of how much attention her dad gave me since my dad had died, and that her dad constantly compared her to me. He kept apologizing to his girlfriend, saying how much he loved her, and that he only agreed to help Julia so that he could earn some money to help pay for her medical bills. I was stunned. Callum was so apologetic and said he'd come clean about everything. He posted it on the school forum to clear my name, and to everyone, to see the ugly truth about Julia. And of course, when Mr. Wall saw it, he made her come and apologize to me. And he also apologized himself, and offered to pay my college fees again. Do you think I accepted his offer? Of course not. I was standing on my own feet now, and there was no going back. I didn't need anyone's help. So you might be wondering how I could afford college? Surely not on my coffee shop salary, right? Well, after graduating high school, I realized how much I missed the bakery. That was where I truly felt happy. So I decided to study to become a pastry chef, and now my mom and I have opened a new bakery. I've never been happier, and there's one last thing I want to share. Oh, in fact, here he is. Hey, Stefan, I've made your mom's fave. Let's go surprise her. I couldn't stop smiling as Stefan took the carrot cake, kissed my cheek, and we headed for his car. Life is so much more simple now, and sweet, and I love it. I'm so nervous. 
You see, today is my first day of school ever. That's right. I'm Heather. I'm 15 years old, and I've never stepped foot inside of a school before. This is because my dad's a scientist and my mom's a writer, so they really cared about my education and worried that the elementary and middle schools in our town wouldn't be good enough. So my mom homeschooled me. Honestly, it was great. I really enjoyed learning about all kinds of different topics, especially literature. But then when I watch TV shows about high schools like The Kissing Booth or High School Musical, I felt a pang in my chest. I was missing out on so many things like having friends and talking to boys. I desperately wanted what those girls on TV had. So, I begged my mom to let me go to high school. It took a lot of persuading and fake tears, but she agreed eventually. I was so excited. Finally, I'd get to experience school firsthand instead of living it vicariously through my favorite TV characters. Oh my god. What should I wear? What would I talk about? How would I make friends? This was actually happening. I could barely sleep the night before, and instead, I took the whole night to prepare myself. This was an important milestone in my life. So, here I am walking down the street to the bus station. Whoa, I've never seen so many people my age before. This is like a dream come true. I spotted an empty seat next to this girl, so I walked over with a smile. Excuse me, can I sit here? The girl looked me up and down, rolled her eyes, then put her bag on that seat. Sorry, it's already taken. Okay, that's fine. I'll sit alone in the back then. No problem. The girl must have gotten up on the wrong side of the bed or something. But, well, turned out it wasn't just the girl on the bus who'd gotten out of bed the wrong way. Because as soon as Mrs. Hickson, my English lit teacher, introduced me to everybody in class, I could see that everyone was giving me weird looks too. Were they making fun of me? But why? Did I have jam on my face? Mrs. Hickson showed me to my seat and the class began. By now, you've all had plenty of time to finish reading The Great Gatsby. Aw, I adore that novel. Throughout the novel, Fitzgerald continuously references a green light that Gatsby keeps on reaching for. Can anyone tell me what the green light symbolizes? I looked around, expecting to see everybody raise their hand. But to my shock, they were all staring down at their desks to avoid eye contact with Mrs. Hickson. Huh? But why? This was so easy. Suddenly, Mrs. Hickson said, No one, huh? Well, how about you, Kelly? Everybody turned and looked at a girl who was adjusting her fake eyelashes in her compact mirror. Kelly continued fiddling with her eyelashes as she replied, Um, doesn't a traffic light have a green light? So, duh, it means that he can cross the street. What? I burst out laughing, but then everyone turned to look at me. Oh, snap. Why was I the only one laughing? I mean, her answer was totally hilarious. Mrs. Hickson walked towards me. Oh, no. Was I in trouble? Heather appears to be the only one here who understands why Kelly's answer was ridiculous. Can you explain this to your classmates? Um, the color green in itself illustrates the idea of greed and money being a symbol of Gatsby's desire for Daisy. Gatsby already has everything anyone could dream for, but still, he is chasing after this light, or in other words, chasing after the love of his life, Daisy. Mrs. Hickson gave me a satisfied smile, patted me on the shoulder, and then she said, That's correct. Very good, Heather. Suddenly, someone coughed out the word, Nerd! Everybody started to laugh. Seriously? How could they laugh at this, but not Kelly's foolish answer? Quiet! Mrs. Hickson then turned to Kelly and said, Perhaps if you used your eyes to actually read a book, instead of only using them to wear fake eyelashes, then Heather here wouldn't need to help you. Kelly glanced over at me, so I smiled at her. But, huh? Why was she giving me a dagger look? Did I do something wrong? After class was over, I was sticking cute pictures in my locker, 
when Kelly and her two friends, Samantha and Brittany, appeared next to me. Heather, right? Yeah, that's right. Oh my god, your sweater is... Oh, do you like it? My mom... So ugly. Why are you even wearing one? It's not even cold. Is your mirror busted or something? Why else would you choose to wear such an awful outfit? Then the three of them started to laugh. What do you mean? I dress just like Jess in New Girl. She looks amazing, doesn't she? This made them laugh even louder. While I was still feeling confused about what just happened, a girl named Taylor walked over. Hi, I overheard what you were talking about. Actually, New Girl ended a few years back, so her style is kinda outdated. Try watching Emily in Paris. That's the trend nowadays. Oh god, I didn't think of that. No wonder the girl on the bus. Oh wait, no wonder everyone at school was giving me awkward looks. They must be thinking I came from the past or something. And you should be careful. Kelly and her gang like to tease others, and I think you're their new target. Oh, so Kelly's stare earlier in class wasn't just a regular stare. But so what? Thanks, but I'm not afraid of them. I know this type of mean girl. They're all bark and no bite. So that night, I binge-watched Emily in Paris. It's tray chic. I studied the fashion style and mixed up some outfits. I looked at myself in the mirror and, oh my, I really did look different. The next day at school, no one was giving me funny looks. How about that? Taylor's advice was really helpful. By the end of the first week, I'd established myself as most of the teacher's favorite student. It sounded great, right? But trust me, it wasn't. Every time a teacher praised me, Kelly and her friends gave me dirty looks. <sighs> then I found a note stuck to my locker that said, You weedo. Right at that moment, Kelly and her friends walked past me giggling. In anger, I ripped off the note and told them, When you're leaving mean comments at my locker, at least write them correctly. Weirdo is missing an R. They immediately stopped laughing and rushed off so that nobody knew it was them. Man, they were so annoying. High school wasn't turning out how I expected it to be. I thought I would be one of the cool kids, not the one being teased. Ugh. Then word got out that I used to be homeschooled. So Kelly began making jokes like, Did your parents make you stay at home because you're a freak? Well, at least thanks to homeschooling, I don't come up with dumb answers in lit class. I snapped back. She stopped laughing and gave me this dumbfounded look. After that, they still carried on with their immature jokes at every given opportunity, but I tried my best to ignore them. But one day, they took it too far. I came to class and saw a big character drawing on the blackboard. It was me! Oh my god, Heather, your portrait looks amazing! <laughs> and the whole class burst out laughing. Ugh, how dare she! You messed with the wrong girl this time, Kelly! That afternoon, I went home and was persistent to find a way to get payback on the mean girls. Bingo! I took out my laptop and began frantically working. After just one night, I managed to hack all their social media accounts, including their iCloud, and found a lot of good stuff. So the next time they mess with me, I'll be prepared. And it didn't take long until Kelly's friends stopped me in the hallway again. Ugh, could your skirt be any longer? Yeah, your grandma called. She wants her clothes back. Suddenly, everyone gathered around us to see what was going on. Good timing. Now we had an audience. Let's give the mean girls a taste of their own medicine. Beautiful hair, Samantha. Tell me, how often do you have to dye it so that nobody knows you're actually a redhead? Well, what did you say? Oh, and Brittany? Nice nose job. What? Everybody shockingly turned to look at Samantha's beautiful blonde hair and Brittany's nose. <laughs> How? Brittany stuttered out before she grabbed Samantha's arm and they fled the scene. Yep, I've learned all about their embarrassing past through the pictures I've hacked last night. After that, Samantha and Brittany didn't dare to bother me, but the three of them were still teasing other people. Then, I couldn't hold my frustration anymore when I saw them making fun of Taylor. Hey, 
Leave her alone! Kelly turned around, smirking. Didn't your parents teach you that it's rude to interrupt people when they're talking? Or do they have weird opinions on that, too? Oh, so that's how she wants to do it. Fine by me. Bring it on. Well, talking of parents, how are your parents doing, Kelly? Oh, wait, aren't they getting divorced? Kelly's grin immediately disappeared and was replaced with a look of complete and utter dread. Then she just ran away without saying anything, leaving her friends shocked as well. That's right. I saw a really long private post about her parents getting divorced on Facebook. That must be her way to express her thoughts. But her bad, it kind of backfired. After the mean girls left, Taylor thanked me, and some of the other students gathered around me and praised me for standing up against Kelly and her clique. From then on, the mean girls avoided me like the plague. <laughs> and just like that, I went from the nerdy homeschooled girl to the cool, popular girl who had the guts to stand up against the mean girls. It felt incredible. Then one day, I went to the bathroom during a class, and I heard someone in the stall, crying. She was talking on the phone. Please, Mom, don't get divorced. Can't you and Dad try to make it work? For me? Oh, man. Could it be Kelly? As I was washing my hands, the stall door opened, and just as I thought, a red-eyed Kelly walked out. As soon as she saw me, she wiped away her tears and gave me a dirty glare. At that moment, I didn't feel good. I felt the complete opposite. I never realized that it was so hard for her. Making her feel bad didn't make me feel good. It made me feel bad too. Kelly, I'm sorry about your parents. But she just snorted, then went to leave. I grabbed her arm. Please, Kelly. I didn't mean to hurt you. Kelly looked me in the eyes and said, But you did! I know. I'm sorry. I wasn't thinking straight. I kept apologizing to her, and after a while she eventually said, <sighs> Well, I suppose I was kind of mean to you too. We ended up talking, and she told me that she teased people to make her feel better about her family situation which she was struggling to deal with. So I opened up to her about how nervous I was about starting school. We actually had a great talk, and the air was cleared between us. So, you see, from that moment on, things between me and the mean girls were great. Oh, wait, they aren't the mean girls anymore, just simply Kelly, Samantha, and Brittany. <laughs> they learned that their actions towards me and other students weren't cool and they finally understood how it felt like being laughed at, so they don't do it to anyone else anymore. So, in the end, high school turned out to be pretty amazing, just like I imagined it to be, but even better! <laughs>
So comes my first day at this place, and this teacher, friend of dad's, Miss Janet Clark, wouldn't quit gawping at me, and she kept on calling on me to answer her stupid questions. Um, no thanks. Ugh, I needed to liven this boring class up. So when the teacher briefly left the room, I immediately put Vaseline on the cap of her water bottle. It was so funny watching her failing to open it and ended up with a smudged hand. Then when she asked the class who was responsible, I grinned as I raised my hand. Another time, I put an air horn on her chair leg, so as soon as she sat down, there was an ear-splitting sound. It's as if she just farted. <laughs> Impressive. How do you think up such crazy pranks? You're even better than me. Huh? I froze for a few seconds. Who was this handsome boy, and why hadn't I noticed him before? Turns out he's Dylan, and like me, he's prone to getting in trouble. We were talking to each other passionately when I felt a hand pat on my shoulder. It was Miss Clark. She led me into the corridor, and I expected her to shout at me, but surprisingly, she didn't get angry or anything. Instead, she asked if I was having a hard time. Hmm? How odd. The next morning, I was about to enter the classroom when some popular girls stopped me. Who are you trying to impress? Better know your place, newbie. She's just another plain Jane. What are you worried about, Rebecca? There's no way Dylan likes her. Stay away from Dylan, else. Excuse me? This snooty girl just messed with the wrong person. And that's how we ended up pulling each other's hair until I managed to get a hold of her wrist and was about to give her a taste of my shoulder throw, then Miss Clark intervened. The so-called Queen Bee quickly fled the scene. Then Miss Clark led me out to the schoolyard for a walk. She told me that this girl Rebecca was Dylan's ex-girlfriend. Oh, how pathetic. Our Becky has a crush on her ex. Then Miss Clark continued asking if I really felt okay, as she thought there must be some reason behind my rebellious behaviors. Just like that, my emotions got the better of me, and I blurted out how I hated moving schools, and the only good thing about this new place was Dylan. And could you believe it? She actually gave me some flirting tips to impress Dylan, and also told me to text her if I had any problems. Hmm, maybe I'd been wrong about Miss Clark. She was actually pretty cool, and I started talking to her pretty often. Then one day, I arrived home to see my bedroom door was ajar. I peeked inside and spotted mom on my bed, iPad in hand, reading my diary on it. Mom, seriously, can you please give me some privacy? Sophie, what's this about a downhill skating event? Do you want to die? It's none of your business. Ugh, mom was so controlling. She wouldn't let me wear the clothes I wanted or even fangirl over the idols I liked. Feeling so wronged, I called Miss Clark to let out this frustration. She was so understanding, saying how adults sometimes make mistakes too, and my mom was in the wrong this time. Then said I should sign up for the skating event, as I was young and therefore I should fight for my dreams. I wish mom understood me like you do. You must be a wonderful mom. Your children are so lucky. She fell silent for a moment, then told me that as much as she wanted to be a mother, but she was divorced and had no kid. Adopt me then. I'd rather be your daughter than my mom's. Then she gently smiled at me. Thanks to Miss Clark, my stuffy home life felt a bit better. While at school, thanks to her matchmaking, Dylan and I were now a couple. Yay! Rebecca thus gave me dirty looks all the time in class. But tough luck, sweetie. And our one month anniversary finally arrived. Today, Dylan's taking me out for sushi. Yum, but I'd only had one bite when a familiar figure rushed over. My mom glared at Dylan, then dragged me home. Don't you ever talk to that awful boy again. You hear me? That kind of troublemaker is nothing but a bad influence. Cut ties with him ASAP. This was insane. But thankfully, Dylan overlooked my mom's craziness, and we continued dating secretly. But then one morning, I texted and called Dylan a bunch of times, but there was no reply. Was something wrong? We just had the best date last night, but now, nothing. I rushed to school, searching for Dylan, worriedly asking everyone if they had heard anything from him. 
when Rebecca suddenly approached me. Dylan could have died thanks to you. Seems like you and your crazy mum are cut from the same cloth. Okay, so turns out that after Dylan dropped me off after our date, he ended up in an accident. Luckily, he wasn't hurt too bad, but he was convinced someone had tampered with his brakes while he made a quick stop at the 7-Eleven near my house. And, yep, that must have been my mum, since he also saw her leave the store. How could she do that? She's ruined my life! Dylan broke up with me right after that. No way was I staying anywhere near her, so I packed a bag and fled to the one place I felt safe. And here I am, at Miss Clark's house. <sighs> Peace and quiet at last. Oh, what's this? She looked so pretty when she was young. I turned a few more pages, then... Huh? Why does this man resemble... My dad? Then I saw a scribble. Janet, Bob, forever. Huh? It was my dad. So, she wasn't just his old friend. She was his ex. A thought suddenly popped into my head. Could she be my real mom? Maybe dad let me transfer to her school so we would be reunited. <laughs> Poof, forgive me. I must have watched too many TV dramas. <laughs> but honestly, how amazing would it be if she was my mom? <sighs> my real mom was such a nightmare. I went to the kitchen to see Miss Clark preparing dinner and couldn't help but blurt out, Mom? She got extremely emotional, then pulled me in for a warm embrace and called me her daughter. Suddenly the phone rang. It was Dad. He told me to go home immediately or he'd stop my allowance. Miss Clark told me not to be worried and just go, but I had to show some attitude to let Mom know that I wouldn't back down easily. So from then on, as soon as I was home, I just went straight to my room without even looking at mom. And also, every time she said anything annoying, I kept replying with, What's wrong with you? My teacher told me to do so. Stop overreacting. And you know what happened next? Yep, mom called dad. Again. I reported it to Miss Clark, as usual. And she told me that if I wanted dad to stop listening to mom, I had to tell him she was having an affair. What? Wasn't that too much? Did Miss Clark still have feelings for my dad? Was she only being nice to me so she could worm her way back into his life? After that, I didn't talk to her as much and tried to avoid her at school, just to be safe. But then one day after lessons, I found her waiting by my locker, looking all glum. She told me it was her birthday, but like every other time, she had no one to celebrate it with. If only you'd be by my side this year, my daughter. So I agreed to go for dinner with her, and then for convenience, I made reservations at mom's restaurant. Hmm, maybe this wasn't such a bad idea. I mean, Miss Clark might be able to talk some sense into her, right? They could even actually get on. But as soon as Miss Clark walked in, mom's face dropped. Janet, what are you doing here? Our restaurant is fully booked. Please leave. The two argued back and forth for a while, and I couldn't stand it anymore. Why are you so rude, Mom? She's my teacher! Mom then stormed off in a rage while Miss Clark and I just ignored her and carried on with our birthday plan. But as she was eating the baked lobster dish, she suddenly turned a funny color, then threw up. We took her to the emergency room, and the doctor said this was down to Ipecac, a vomit-inducing medicine. Who else is to blame? How could my mom be so cruel? Sophie, I'm fine. I'm sure your mom meant no harm. Mom looked furious and rushed over to Miss Clark. I had to pull her back, and then I told her she didn't deserve to be my mom. She was speechless and burst into tears. But it was too late. I announced I would move out of the house and stay with Miss Clark instead. So I went home and packed straight away, then left. But Mom wouldn't quit following me that whole week. It's super annoying. So Miss Clark came up with a new idea. We should move somewhere where Mom wouldn't find us. Huh? Was it a bit too sudden? But this was the only way I could be rid of my freaky mom. So we moved to a little house in the suburbs. Miss Clark took good care of me and completed all of my school transfer procedures. The first few days were so much fun, 
We had a really good time together. However, I started to notice odd little things, such as she fed me pizza every single day. Pizza and pizza only. She also insisted I wear these worn old clothes and called me Dumpling? What a weird nickname. At first I just wondered why she did that, but then it started to bug me, so I asked her to stop. To my surprise, she started crying. <sighs> Looks like I was stuck with this awful nickname. Things at home seemed off, and the new school was just as terrible. From the very first day, I again became the target of the mean girls. But one day, as they tried to stop me passing them, one of their faces suddenly turned pale. Uh, huh? Isn't that Alice's gross old shirt? Alice who? You know, Alice. The dumpling. She wore the exact same shirt with the word smart printed on it. I remember this vividly as I used to laugh at how brazen of that stupid girl for wearing a shirt saying smart. My god, even the trace of my cigarette butt on its flap? It's still there? But she's dead. Then they all looked at each other in fear and ran away. H uh, huh? Chills ran down my spine. I didn't know who this Alice was and I didn't want to. The only thing I knew was I needed to get out of this place immediately. So I rushed home to pack my things before Miss Clark got back from work, but it was too late. Dumpling, where are you going? You have to stay with mommy. Then she quickly locked the door, dragged me inside, and started acting like a psychopath. Eat up, my dumpling. Why are you so sad? It's seafood pizza, your favorite. I'm sorry I didn't let you eat it before, but now you can have it all you want. I'll buy this for you every day. Panicked, I didn't know how to hold out against this insane woman when someone kicked in the door. It was Dylan, followed by my parents. Sophie! Here you are, our baby. Oh, thank good God. I pushed Janet away and ran straight to them. But how did they find me? I decided to look into the case of my broken brake again, as a few days after the accident, I came back to that 7-Eleven, and a cashier asked me if my mom came home safely the other day, as she saw a woman claiming to be my mom struggling by my motorcycle, saying there's some problem with it. That sounded way too fishy, so I asked to check the store's CCTV footage. And the culprit was not your mom as we all thought, but her. Huh? Why? She helped matchmake us. Why would she want to harm you? I don't know. Maybe she wants everyone to misunderstand and blame your mother. Luckily, our phones have still been sharing locations ever since we were dating, so I found you in time. Many thanks to you, Dylan. My father angrily looked at Miss Clark. Janet, things between us ended decades ago. Please get a hold of yourself. Oof, how ridiculous. Who do you think you are to assume this is about you? Dumpling is mine. She's my daughter and she's staying with me. She broke down crying and then admitted it all. From damaging Dylan's motorbike to putting amnic medicine in her own food to fool people. I've tried everything. I can't believe it. How could a gentle person like her do such things? After the truth was revealed, everything gradually got back on track. I went back home, but still, my mind constantly wandering back to her and why she did it. Until one day, I came home from school and was surprised to see that woman sitting on the couch in our living room having a coffee with mom. To be honest, I was a bit frightened at the sight of her, but she didn't look as unstable as before. It turned out that she'd just returned from a psychotherapy unit. She'd been suffering from her mental health since Alice, her daughter, passed away. Alice, aka Dumpling, was a stubborn teenager, just like me, and due to the strictness of her mom, she once left home in a temper and never came back as she got in a terrible car accident that night. So, as soon as Miss Clark saw me, she subconsciously wanted to turn me into her daughter to fix her past mistakes. Sophie, I'm truly sorry for the pain I caused you. I let my grief consume me and, as a result, I refused to accept how dark a place I was in. Teenagers are complicated. But please try to be more open-minded. 
and show them love the correct way. Sophie's a good kid, and I don't want you making the same mistakes I did. Hmm. And so, everything ended in a good way. Although my mom and I still sometimes argue, now we both know how to control it. I also learned to share things with her so that we became closer. And now, when she calls dad, it's no longer to snitch on me, <laughs> but it's to talk about how our days went. By the way, I don't have to go on secret dates anymore either. There's my Prince Charming. How many times have I told him not to rev up the engine? Is it usual for you to sit on strangers the first time you meet them? This jerk! I'll show him that he's messing with the wrong girl. It's fine! Please don't hit him! Don't worry. And this is for mugging a kid! No, no, you've got it wrong! He just saved me from those muggers, and he was just teaching me how to fight back at them. Oh my, I thought... It was just because the boy's bag was on the ground and that guy was holding his arm like he was about to hit him. I awkwardly stood up, literally screamed out to apologize, then ran straight home. So, as you can see, my home's a little different from the usual. My parents run a nursing home, so I grew up surrounded by the elderly. You were so embarrassed that you left him laying there and ran away? The first time I met my husband... I also knocked him over with my dolio chagi. Perhaps this boy is your destiny. Poof! No way, Mrs. Jones. Suddenly, my dad huffed past us. Oh no, I know that look. Something was bad. Lately, our finances haven't been so good. I went after him to check he was okay and found him talking to a man in the yard. On seeing me, the strange man waved me over. Do you know this person? Huh? That was the guy I almost punched earlier. That's right. The person you almost knocked out is my son. I saw everything, so I followed you here. He's got in with a bad crowd and lost focus on his studies. I want you to steer him in the right direction. I... I don't want to be a babysitter. I'm sorry. It's too bad about this nursing retreat, isn't it? Seems like it'll have to close soon. Although, if swayed, I don't mind being a major sponsor. <gasps> this was insane! So, all I needed to do was keep an eye on his son, and all the nursing home's problems would be solved? Dad said I didn't have to do it if I didn't want to, but how could I say no? Okay, I'll do it! So, which school am I transferring to? Jeez, everything here was so shiny. But if I had a choice... This would be the last school in town I ever wanted to attend. I entered the classroom and walked over to the only empty seat that happened to be at the back. I was about to sit down, then... Ah! Some dude pulled the chair aside and caused me to fall onto my butt. A hand appeared to pull me up, but as I went to grab it, it immediately drew back, leaving me sitting there embarrassed while everyone's laughing at me. Oops, sorry. I guess I should only give a hand when asked, right? Ugh, it was Blake. I quickly regained my cool face, sat down, and put on my headphones, pretending like I didn't hear any of those comments from other students about my rustic look. This girl seems interesting. The usual. A grand if you can win her heart in a month. Deal? Blake glanced at me and sneered at the guy. Easy. Deal. So that's how it's gonna be, is it? Luckily, I hadn't turned my music on yet, hence why I heard the whole conversation. Let me help you get some extra pocket money then, Blake. And it didn't take him long to start implementing his plan. At lunchtime, he enthusiastically led me to the canteen, guided me to get food, and even asked the lunch lady to get me an extra portion of yogurt. Nice try. I was trying to enjoy my lunch when a shrill voice sounded out. Get up and get me some food. I want a cupcake just like yours. Now! Jeez, why did some girls think it was okay to treat guys like this? Frustrated, I went over there, picked up the cake from that boy's tray, and shoved it into her mouth. There, happy now? Poor thing, your arms must be so broken that you can't get food yourself. 
Let me feed you then. You're welcome. Are you crazy? You're dead meat today. She raised her hand about to slap me, but I quickly dodged, causing her to fall to the ground. As for me, I calmly sat down next to the boy and had my lunch. Sorry for wasting the cake. You can have my yogurt if you want. He's Kai, my first friend at this new school. He's witty, smart, and has a seriously impressive academic record. He was actually here on scholarship, which explained why he didn't quite fit in, just like me. I noticed how Blake seemed rather annoyed and kept staring at me. I bet he was just fed up with being teased by his friends, since I just totally ignored him. Oh, but he didn't give up that easily. The next morning, he showed up at mine to pick me up, but I'd rather run two laps around the schoolyard for being late than share a ride with you. Then at school, he tripped me up and then reached out his hand pretending to help. But between you and the floor, I picked the floor. He even waited for me at the school gates with a huge bouquet of roses. But I just took one look at them, then started coughing. Are you allergic to flowers? <coughs> nope. I'm allergic to immature and boring people, like you. Then I walked off. Ugh as if every girl was going to fall for these lame tricks. This carried on for the next few weeks, but then one time, he approached me in the library while I was studying with Kai and handed me a necklace. I looked at it, then passed it back to him and turned to talk to Kai. Seriously? You're turning me down for this nerd? Kai's smart, gallant, and sophisticated. Unlike you, all you are is a troublemaker. Are you looking down on me? Oh, finally. I was wondering how much longer would it take for you to figure that out. Not to mention, you've not helped once with the English lit essay. You're in my group, but you probably just think the Grapes of Wrath is a rock band or something. So, if I can finish that essay on my own, will you go on a date with me? Fine, but it has to score an A, else you can forget it. And my trick worked. Blake actually completed the essay on his own. He's smart, but he's neglectful of his studies, and it's made him make mistakes. On being handed back the essay, Blake's face fell. He got a B, and even though he knew it was over, he still stayed in class to reread the teacher's comments. It seemed like this was the first time he actually put in the effort to do something. <laughs> What's wrong? Still in denial of your failure? Blake turned away without looking at me. The rich boy who lost the game for the first time looked so cute. So I put a gift with a message in it on Blake's desk. Needless to say, he was over the moon. In it was a set of clothes I'd bought for him and an invitation to a bar at the weekend. Why, you wonder? Oh, you'll see. That Saturday night, Blake showed up in the outfit I had gifted him and looked anything but pleased. <laughs> I can't come in wearing this. It's so old-fashioned. My friends will laugh at me. You invited your friends, too? To prove that you won the bet, right? If you get that thousand dollars, will I have a share? You already knew it? I was just joking at first. But now... Let's go inside now. Don't worry. We won't be here for long. I dragged him inside, and immediately, his friends didn't miss the opportunity to tease me. Did the fish get hooked? Yes, I'm trapped. Quickly give him a grand. His family is bankrupt and in dire need of money. Huh? What? You're lying. Look, he's wearing donated clothes. Even his branded clothes have been liquidated. I winked at Blake, and he immediately reacted. Lend me some money. I need a place to stay, a sports car, and pocket money too. At this point, his friends turned nasty and told him he no longer qualified to be in their group. You didn't have to do that. I already knew they only hung out with me for the money. But that's what people are just like. <sighs> Why would he think that? He must have never been cared for and loved properly. Get rid of that face. This is a date, after all. Let me make it up to you. A bar that matches this outfit. So I dragged Blake to our evening party. I told everyone that I brought a friend to lend a hand, and the elderly immediately made him do all sorts of things. 
Mrs. Hastings asked him to climb the tree to hang the string lights. Mr. Derbyshire called him to chop wood for the campfire, and Mr. Shaw wanted him to taste his homebrewed beer. Then the next second, Blake's already sitting on the drum throne. Huh, <laughs> it's been a long time since we had a young volunteer. That boy seems fine, doesn't he? I saw the way he looked at you. He's not suitable for me. I shrugged in response to her and suddenly felt disappointed. Yes, I liked this different side to him, but we were still from different worlds. The next morning at school, I still saw Blake hanging out with his greedy friends. Looks like he hadn't learned his lesson. Frustrated that all my efforts were in vain, I swung open my locker. Hmm, what was this note? Meet me at the library at 6 p.m. when everyone has left. I have a surprise for you. B. I shouldn't be like this, right? Waiting for him at the library for hours until everyone left, nervous and excited. But as soon as the last person left, the lights suddenly went out, and the library door slammed shut. What's happening? Could it be that the note wasn't from Blake? I screamed out of fear. That's right. I may excel at martial arts, but I hate the dark. With a shaking hand, I dialed the phone to call Blake, and then slumped down in fear and sobbed. At that moment, the sound of the door unlocking startled me. As soon as the door opened, I quickly ran to hug Blake. Are you okay? I can't believe Chloe did this. I told you not to get near them. Huh? This wasn't Blake's voice. Freya, are you okay? Oh my god, it was Kai who opened the door to save me. But I thought that... I quickly let go of him, then ran away in embarrassment. That's strange. When I was in danger, the first person I thought of was Blake. Could it be that I... really liked him? At that moment, the phone rang. It was my dad. Mrs. Jones had suffered a heart attack and needed surgery immediately. But the surgery cost was so much. Where could we get that money? Ah, oh, yes. Blake's dad. So I called him. Hello, is this Mr. Morris? Blake stopped hanging out with his friends and did his homework. I really need the money now. Please, it's urgent. Are you bringing me out to trade with my dad? My God. It seems like Blake heard all the conversation. I... I... So, I'm just your money-making tool? And all this time you've trained me as your pet? It's not like that! We'll talk later. There's no time for your selfish thoughts right now. I gotta go! I ran like crazy to the hospital. My parents were desperate, and the money hadn't arrived yet. So I called Mr. Morris again. You said Blake had changed. If this is the case, then why did he just get fined for speeding and resisting police? Don't ever call me again. Don't worry, Freya. I'll sell the nursing home land to take care of Mrs. Jones. Everyone's agreed to move to the government nursing home. We sold our house, and now we live with Mrs. Jones in a new town. She's so much better now, but I do miss the other elderly people. Also, I miss Blake. I still keep in touch with Kai, and he told me that Blake has gone to some military school like his dad wanted. Well, that's unexpected from him. You should talk to that guy. Not about what you did, but confess your feelings to him. That will save you from regrets later. Then she patted me on the shoulder to comfort me. But I really don't have the courage to do it. I was feeling guilty. Mrs. Jones, you have a letter. Freya, look. It's the invitation to a nursing home concert. It's our concert, isn't it? Trembling, I took the invitation. What is this? I pushed Mrs. Jones's wheelchair to the door of the nursing home named Sunflower. When we walked in, we all burst into tears. Everyone was there. This is all Blake's doing. He's such a kind boy. He found us and built us a dream nursing home. You and Freya were the surprise gift we prepared for him, but as soon as he saw the two of you, he ran away. Hearing that, I rushed to the gate. 
a car passed me. My gut told me it was him. I ran after it and shouted in despair, Blake, wait! I like you! I really like you! But the car quickly went out of sight. I helplessly slumped down on the street, tears streaming down my face, and I still muttered, I really do like you. What are you saying? Say it louder. I turned around startled. It was Blake. He was in his military uniform and smiling at me fondly. Yeah, here's another load of bills to add to the pile. Oh, hey, I'm Zoe, a recent graduate turned office worker with a lousy wage. I could barely afford to pay for food and rent, let alone think about my college debt. It wouldn't matter so much if it was just me, as I could live off of noodle soup. But I also had Birdie to think about, my little sister. Oh, she's back from school. Zoe, I found Daddy today! Huh? I looked at her with a wry smile. Actually, this was nothing new. You see, our parents died when Birdie was just a toddler, so now... She longed to have parents just like her friends did. She often said to me, Zoe, you're like my mommy, but Clara and Polly have daddies too, and I want one. She was so innocent that whenever she saw a friendly looking man on the street, she'd ask me, is that my daddy? <laughs> come on, come here. How was school today? Daddy is very handsome and he lives in a big house. Come on, I'll take you to him. Oh, my lord. This wasn't a house. It was a mansion. Confused, I was about to question Bertie on this, but she started ringing the bell repeatedly. Before I could stop her, someone who appeared to be the butler came out and happily let us inside without questioning anything. That's odd. I sipped on my iced tea and peered around at the grandness of the place, absorbing the rich energy, when suddenly, a very dashing guy walked over. There he is! That's Daddy! Huh? This was so confusing, and seeing her hug a stranger was super embarrassing. I had a talk with the guy to figure out what happened, and apparently he's called Harry, and he's 22 like me. Huh? That's crazy, as he looks and acts way older. As for the dad story, it turns out as Bertie was waiting for the school bus, she saw a woman drop her purse. So she rushed over and picked it up and was about to return it, but the woman turned around, saw Bertie holding it, and accused her of being a thief. Just in time, Harry appeared and claimed to be her father to settle the matter. Then he took her to the mansion and showed her around. So that's what happened. Oh, my sister. Bertie has told me everything. She's such a precious child. I'd happily adopt her. No way! Why not? You like being here, don't you, Birdie? Zoe, I really like it here. I can play with Oreo as much as I want. And now, I have a daddy just like Clara and Polly do. But I can't just leave her alone. Of course not. You can stay with Birdie. <laughs> what? How come such a good person suddenly fell from the sky? Skeptical, I told Harry I needed more time to think. He smiled and handed me his business card and told me to call him any time. What is this? Harry Atkins, the eldest son of the chairman of ATLAC Corp? Unbelievable! His name was all over the internet as a rich and educated young man. If that was the case, then surely this had to be legit, right? <sighs> I can't afford to pay these. My sister and I deserve better than this life. Besides, it would be nice to have a place to stay for free, right? So the next day, I went to see Harry and offered to help with the housework as payment. Harry agreed and presented a prepared contract. Contract? Okay. But there was a clause in it that required me not to mention that I was Bertie's sister. Hmm, this was a little odd, but never mind. It didn't matter. Here was to our new luxurious life. Wait. But does that mean I also have to call him dad? <laughs> so, yeah, my new life began. And oh boy, it was crazy. A maid brought me breakfast in bed and did all my laundry. So much for helping out with household chores. 
there are actually more servants in this house than the number of staff in my office. So it's obvious that there's nothing left for me to do. Even so, I wanted to be useful, because hearing them calling me Miss made me feel quite embarrassed. However, oops, turns out I suck at house chores. Once I put Harry's fine suit in the washing machine and ended up ruining it, which made him pace up and down the room in anger. Also, he couldn't seem to say anything nice about me, always complaining about the flowers I bought or saying the muffins I spent hours baking were too chewy. He threw away all of my handmade stuff because he thought it was garbage. What a rude man! Oh, wait, he's not even a man. He's just a stubborn kid who doesn't care about other people's feelings. I tell ya, if it weren't for Bertie and that contract, I'd... Poof! But those are just small gripes. In general, our life here was great. Bertie is very happy, and seeing her living her best life makes me smile. But unbeknown to me, turns out this was the calm before the hurricane. Hurricane Rachel! Harry's betrothed fiancé since childhood, she's from a rich family and is therefore deemed a suitable marriage alliance to Harry's family. I overheard the servants in the house saying that Harry is the successor to the company. So when he marries Rachel, the company will be even more flourishing. As soon as she saw me, Rachel kept asking Harry, Hey, who is this? Why is she here? And this girl too. Why is there a kid in the house? Who is this scary lady? Hearing that, Rachel looked at me from head to toe and then started firing questions at me. Why are you here? How do you know Harry? When are you leaving? Enough! What a relief. Harry intervened just in time, then dragged her into the reading room. Rachel followed Harry, but didn't forget to wrap her arms around his neck as she peered at me with a smug look on her face. Huh? What does she mean by that? Ugh. Is she... jealous? If that's the case, then she's wasting her time. Because it is true that I have a crush on someone, but it's not Harry. You see, the other week I was wandering home from the grocery store when I met the love of my life. My shopping bag split, and my soda, cookies, and potato chips tumbled out. I was trying to pick everything up without getting run over, when suddenly a guy appeared and helped me. Then he drove me home. His name's Marcus, and he's so hot. After that, we exchanged numbers, and have been texting ever since. Marcus is so easy to talk to, so I confided in him about everything, from Bertie being adopted to the fact that I'm now working as a housekeeper. He's so sweet and kind, and I feel like I can tell him anything. He's the prince of my dreams. Anyway, my strange life in the mansion continued. One thing's for sure, Harry was great with Bertie. For her birthday, he surprised her with a trip to the amusement park. I have to admit, we had a lot of fun together. Bertie made us go on the carousel five times. Then we got ice cream. Suddenly, I noticed Harry giving me this odd look. What? You have some ice cream on your lips. Here. He leaned forward and gently dabbed it away with a napkin. Just then, a crowd rushed in, and Harry reached out and pulled me and Bertie closer to him. Our eyes met, and... Huh? Why did I have goosebumps and a pounding heart? What did that mean? Did he do that intentionally or not? Why did I have this strange feeling? While I was still sinking deep in my thoughts, Harry stopped the car and said he needed to pass by his brother's place for some files. Huh? Isn't that... Marcus? Marcus? I blurted out. You two know each other? I didn't answer. Instead, I turned my attention to Bertie. When we got home... I kept wondering why Marcus never told me who he was. I texted him to ask, and he replied that they don't get along, so he didn't want me to know. Hmm. Despite all that, I stayed up all night thinking about Marcus. And, and, um, also Harry. It's safe to say I was confused about everything. Then, Marcus and Rachel suddenly showed up at Harry's house one day with a load of groceries. Rachel announced that she was baking a cake as it's soon going to be her birthday, and we should all assist. Okay, weird, but whatever. I was preparing the mixture when Marcus took my stirring hand and insisted on helping me. Suddenly, Harry burst in between us. Upon seeing this, Rachel yanked on his arm and pulled him away. 
My eyes widened in horror as I saw the mixture fly into the air and slow-mo splatter all over us. We stood there covered in cake mixture as we all exchanged dirty looks. Um, okay, so after that little display, I think it's clear to say that Harry has feelings for me. Later on, when Marcus and Rachel had left and I was freshly showered, Harry knocked on my door and smiling at me said, Zoe, there's a family dinner tomorrow where you'll get to meet my parents. Don't worry, you won't have to say anything. As a way of saying thanks, I'll pay off your college debts. Okay, so that was weird, but at this point, I'd learned not to question it anymore. Besides, it would be so nice to be debt-free, and it was just dinner, right? I want to break off the engagement with Rachel. This is my girlfriend, and we already have a kid together. Wh- what I almost blurted out, but Harry squeezed my hand to stop me from saying anything, so I sat there with a dumbfounded look on my face. Right at that moment, Marcus and Rachel burst in. Stop the act! Mom, Dad, this isn't his girlfriend, and that little girl is actually her sister. She's just some poor maid. Yes, that's right. I've known all along. I'm the one who told Marcus to pretend to like you to get proof. What is all this? Mom, Dad, I don't think a liar like him should be the heir of your company. I hope you rethink your decision. I didn't understand. What's going on here? Girlfriend? My child who? The heir of what? I just knew one thing only. That I was fooled by both my crush and Harry. I felt like such an idiot. So I quickly grabbed Bertie, packed up all my stuff, then ran out of that mansion immediately. Poor innocent Bertie seemed so confused. She kept asking where her daddy was and why she couldn't stay with him. I took what was left of our savings to rent a small apartment for both of us. Life went back to normal. Final demand letters and all. This was our reality. I knew that now. The last two months were like a dream. It was time to wake up. But still, I felt a pang of sadness whenever I thought about how Harry had fooled me. I was snooping around online and saw an article about how Marcus had taken over the company, only to end up bankrupt due to his poor decision-making. As for Harry, well, he'd founded his own startup, and it seemed to be doing pretty well. But then, one sunny day, I was on my way to pick up Bertie from school when a familiar person walked alongside me. Hey, it's a nice day, isn't it? Harry? What do you want? Look, I admit that at first, I was just using you to get out of my engagement with Rachel. But then, I... I... I want you and Bertie in my life. I love you, Zoe. Please come home with me. I was grabbing a book out of my locker when some guy's shout startled me. Hey everyone, the results are over here! Oh, it's just the results of the Mind Buzz, our annual high school general knowledge competition. People, what's the rush? Don't we all know what it'll be like already? See, nothing's changed. That's my name, there, the first place of Willowmere High, as always. And of course, what came along with it were endless praises from everyone. Way to go, Millie, you're our school superhero. Oh my gosh, you're amazing, I'm so jealous of you. Yep. Hi, I'm Millie, the girl who always aces every school contest and is therefore adored by the other students, all the teachers, and the principal. Later that day, as soon as I stepped out of art class, Alice, my excitable best friend, jumped out of nowhere and squealed out, I just found this really cool place. We have to go there right now. No chance. I have the final round of the blast from the past contest tomorrow. I mean, history is my forte, so I'm sure to win, but I still want to cram in some last minute studying. Come on. We all know you'll win anyway. You even said that yourself. So let's just hang out for a little, please. Fine, but only because I'm an amazing friend. Hmm, okay, I have to admit, this place was actually kind of cool. It's an adorable cafe hidden at the end of a street corner. But wait a minute, what's up with that sticker on the window? Isn't that the Leafmore High School symbol? No way we're setting foot in that taboo place! 
I tried tugging on Alice's arm and gesturing for us to leave, but she stood her ground and replied, Come on, Millie. We have to try their croissants. All the food bloggers are talking about it. But this is Leafmore's territory. Look! So? It's not like anyone will recognize us. Before I could comprehend what was happening, she dragged me inside. Oh well, it seems like we've gone too far to draw back, so I may as well sample what this place has to offer. Why was our order taking so long? And what was with Alice? Ugh, how many selfies did one girl need to take? I was clenching my fists to stop myself from anxiously fidgeting when two boys walked towards our table. Hey cutie, I've not seen you in here before. What grade are you in? Oh no, how should I answer this question? I quickly turned away, pretending to rummage through my bag to avoid his gaze. But they still didn't leave me alone, as the other guy said, Wait, this girl doesn't seem to be from our school. Are you? Oh snap, did he recognize me? My skin turned clammy with nerves and I thought I was going to throw up. Then suddenly a voice rang out. Sorry I'm late. Have you been waiting long? Then he plonked himself down next to us. Seeing that, the two guys left. Phew! But who is this guy? Do we know him? Oh my god, Evan, it's you! Mmm, is that the new Calvin Klein cologne? It smells amazing on you. Huh? Evan? As in, Evan Summers? The top student in Leafmore, aka my biggest competition in tomorrow's contest? To Alice's excitement and my puzzled look, Evan just lightly smiled, then got up to leave. <sighs> He's indeed a cold angel. What? All he was to me was arrogant. You're probably wondering what the deal between Willowmere and Leafmore is, right? They're the two biggest high schools in this town, but like the same poles of magnets, they repel each other. The two schools have been rivals since forever, competing with each other from academic achievements to collective activities. In competitions organized by the town, such as marathons, Halloween decorations, or even cooking contests. And of course, the students from both schools despise each other so much that we have boundaries in town. For example, this cafe is only for Leafmore students, while only Willowmere students are allowed in that bookstore. Breaking these rules could lead to outright carnage. The schools take this super seriously. Hence, there's even a rule saying we can't interact with each other. And dating is a real no-no. You see, as the top student in Willowmere, I can't let anyone find out I've stepped foot in Leafmore territory, as if they do, my life won't be worth living. And also, because of my number one position, I have a responsibility to help my school win as many prizes as possible. And this history contest is no exception. I anxiously waited for the host to announce the results. And the last 20 points go to Leafmore High School, which makes them the winners of today's contest. From the other side of the hall, the Leafmore students erupted into applause, and they all charged at Evan and hugged him. Seeing the arrogant Evan with a triumphant face made me even more upset. Congratulations, you were amazing! Alice, we lost! Only by five points! Second place is still good, but it was me who was defeated by that Evan! Poor Alice is still trying to keep her shy smile at me. I didn't want to take it out on her either, so I quickly left. The next day I was walking along the school corridor, minding my own business, when I passed a group of students gossiping about me. Poof, she definitely lost the quiz on purpose. Yeah, her question was so easy. Everyone knows that the first US dollar was printed in 1862. Why were they saying such mean things about me? I tried my best to ignore their jibes and distract myself with my phone, but what is this? Someone had uploaded a picture of me, Alice, and Evan all sitting together in that cafe the other day. Oh no. And we're still, from this angle, we all looked kind of close. Furious, I went to leave, but Polly, this annoying girl, blocked my way and mocked me. Millie, if you don't like this place, you could have transferred schools. Losing to leave more on purpose is just embarrassing. I did no such thing. Not that it's any of your business. I hurried away from her and her smirking friends. The problem is, it seemed like the entire school had seen that picture and concluded that I'm a traitor. At least things couldn't get any worse, right? Wrong. My bad luck continued when I got my English Lit essay back. A B minus. This can't be right. I never get anything lower than an A. Ever. 
I was checking through my test when suddenly there was an announcement on the speaker, asking me to come to the principal's office. Millie, you're usually such an excellent student, but I've received some unpleasant news about you recently, and your grades are slipping significantly. I could only stare down at the floor and mumbled, I'm really sorry. I'd never been scolded by the principal before. This was the worst day of my life. Miss Garcia was silent for a moment before she continued. However, I still have faith in you, so I'm giving you one last chance to prove yourself. The town's hosting a Rube Goldberg machine camp and our school must win. Can you make that happen, Millie? I forced a smile and nodded. No problem, ma'am. The first prize will be ours. Trust me. This is my chance to show everyone that I'm devoted to this school. However, there's one teensy tiny problem. Physics is not my forte. It's all right, I just gotta do my best, right? I spent the next two weeks planning, researching, and testing out ideas with my group. We finally managed to create the perfect Rude Goldberg machine. It includes 15 genius steps to complete the final task. We're surely gonna secure all these bonus points. Finally, the camp weekend arrived, and I was super stoked to show off my team's entry. Tomorrow will be it. I'll get Willamere's name back on top again. Then suddenly, Miss Garcia tapped my shoulder and gestured me over to an empty corner and worriedly said, Leafmore's machine is highly praised by the judges. At this rate, they're most likely to win, and that'll mean humiliation for us. Don't worry, I'm trying my best. We'll add some extra magnets and springs. It's no use. The only way we'll win over Leafmore is if their entry encounters problems. She sighed, then turned to leave. Feeling deflated, I stared down at my feet. That's when I saw a pocket knife, with Miss Garcia's name printed on it, lying on the ground. I picked it up and called out, Miss, you dropped your knife! But Miss Garcia didn't stop walking or turn back, and just did a snipping gesture with her fingers. Could it be that Miss Garcia meant... Yep, definitely. That's the only way. So that night, I waited until everyone else was asleep, then I snuck into the gallery and cut a piece of wire holding the light bulb of Leafmore's model. That should be enough. I was about to leave the room when suddenly the lights came on. What are you doing here? I... I... You just did this, didn't you? Um... Yeah? So what? Go ahead, tell on me if you want. This is all so meaningless. Then he sat down and started fixing his model. Huh? What's meaningless? Good God, he's so full of himself. Fine then. Just you wait, Evan. I'll beat you with my own talent. Let's see if you'll still be Mr. Arrogant then. It was my team's turn, and for the first three steps, the Rube Goldberg machine worked quite smoothly. But when it came to the fourth step, suddenly the wooden slide collapsed, causing the marble to fall to the ground and the machine to stop working. We all stared at each other in panic. No, 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 this couldn't be happening. We tested it many times this morning and it had worked perfectly fine. I rushed over to check what was wrong with the machine, but I struggled and couldn't find a way to fix it. When suddenly a voice said, Let me see. I looked up. It was Evan. I stepped aside to make room for him, when suddenly Miss Garcia appeared. I see what's happened here. Clearly, Leafmore High knew the only way they'd win was by sabotaging the best entry. The whole hall started to stir, but I felt my skin prickle with unease. I didn't think this was Leafmore's doing. Look at Evan. He didn't even bother telling the judges about last night's incident. Immediately after that, Leafmore's principal, Miss Harris, said, Miss Garcia, you can't go around accusing us without proof. Clearly, you're the one who feels the need for underhand tactics to win, not us. Then she held out her phone and circled the crowd so everyone could see. I gasped in shock. There on the screen was a picture of me standing next to Leafmore's model with a knife. Miss Harris continued. Seeing as we managed to fix it in time, we decided not to mention anything else about it. But then you dared to accuse us. The crowd glared and tutted at me, and I longed for the floor to swallow me whole. I put blood, sweat, and tears into creating our model, and now people just thought I was a cheat. The worst part was they were right. I was one. The jury went off to discuss this, then they announced their conclusion. Willowmere had been disqualified. Immediately, Mrs. Garcia piped in. 
This is hardly fair. That was the action of one individual, not the whole group. I assure you that Millie is no longer on the team, so let my school continue to compete without her. I froze in shock. How could Miss Garcia do this to me? It had been all her idea, hadn't it? She'd given me the knife! The realization of what just happened hit me and I fell to my knees and burst into tears. All that hard work and for nothing! Even Alice hugging me in comfort didn't release me from my gut-wrenching, sinking feeling. Then to my surprise, Evan said, Mrs. Garcia, can you explain why I found this knife with your name engraved on it next to our model? He raised the knife up for everyone to see. Oops, in all the stress of last night, I must have dropped it. Ms. Garcia turned ghostly pale and everyone started to buzz about it. I can't believe you colluded with your students to do this. You're no different from her. Last night, Miss Harris instructed me to tamper with Willowmere's model, but I refused. As if we win, I wanted it to be fairly. The whole hall once again began to stir and copped on amazed as Evan continued. I'm so tired of the petty feud between our schools. It's so dumb and meaningless. The jury went off to discuss this further and came back with a new announcement. Both schools were disqualified. It's shameful. But, well, it's for the best. We really don't deserve to be here. Oh boy, that sure was eventful. The scandal between the two schools was hot gossip in the town for days. They even brought it up at the monthly town meeting. That's when the truth came out that Ms. Garcia and Ms. Harris had history. They were in the same year at school and were fiercely competitive against each other. So years later, when both of them became principals of the two schools, began this whole feud war. In the end, both principals were forced to leave their positions. So now what? Well, there aren't any dumb rules about where I can go anymore, which is good, because I actually really like it here. I've learned my lesson and I'm never going to let anyone pressure me into cheating ever again. Peace has returned to school life, and it feels good. Oh, and as for Evan, I'm actually studying with him right now for our next Blast from the Past quiz. Only this time, I'm definitely going to beat him. <laughs>